Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to be starting shortly, and here up here is the conference agenda. Um, so we'll have Nigel Palmer on soil amendments, then I'll be speaking on rainwater catchment. And then later on, we'll have a discussion and Q&A. And so here's some information on our speaker today. Okay, so yep, here's his his book. And so uh, Nigel, we'll put you up first if that works for you. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about these important subjects. Um, so uh, I have a, um, my normal agenda for teaching on Zoom is, is to try and make it as close to a classroom environment as possible. And as you see now, we're in a, a gallery view so that we can all see each other um, and wave and make funny faces and, and all the things that people do in a classroom. Um, fortunately, no spitballs are permitted, and uh, that's strictly enforced by the fact that you can't hit me with a, a pea shooter if you wanted to. Um, anyway, to try and make this as realistic a classroom as, in, as possible, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to speak for a bit using PowerPoint, and then I'm going to try and bring it back to this view, this gallery view, and, and try and answer questions. And I've broken the presentation material into three large groups. And um, within each of those groups, there will be an opportunity to pause to ask questions. And um, this way, you don't have to try and remember your question, which never happens for me. I, my questions go in this side and they go out that side really quickly. Um, and, and so when we do have conversations, we'll be actually able to look at each other. So I think that helps uh, with the conversation and the quote classroom environment. Also at the end of the presentation material, we can have a, a more general Q&A rather than focusing on the topics that uh, are discussed as we go forward. Um, okay, so a little bit about background about me. Uh, so I'm a, I was a, a, an aerospace engineer for 37 years um, and I um, solved aerospace problems. Um, and it was really fun doing so. But uh, I've also had a garden for pretty much my entire adult life since I was uh, early 20s. And I grew food um, because it was fun. Uh, it was just something to do. And it provided a connection to the earth and the world around us, which is getting harder and harder to do these days. Um, and uh, sometime, uh, I'd say when my wife and I were in our 30s, maybe, um, we had children and of course sharing growing food in a garden with children was very important to try and introduce them to these wonderful ideas. Um, but there came a time probably in our 40s where we recognized that the food that we were purchasing in the store was not getting any better. And the advent of genetically modified foods and some of the pesticides that uh, are put on foods, uh, Roundup specifically, made things a little bit more deleterious. And we recognized that the best healthcare program that we could possibly put forward was to grow our food ourselves. And so we started to grow food and we tried to grow enough food to last a year of certain crops. And we started off with garlic, which is one of uh, my favorite things to grow. And we were able to eventually grow a year's supply of garlic. And then we moved to potatoes and fruits and herbs and, and things like that. And while we were doing so, um, I was a strong proponent of not purchasing any, anything in a store. Um, I think uh, uh, most of the things that are sold in the store and the agricultural world are probably not very good for the soil or ourselves. And so, or it has unknown origins or the people that are actually manufacturing or putting together these products uh, are not treated fairly. And then there's the support of the oil industry to distribute these things all over the world and the packaging and all the things that go along with it. So I was inspired to try and figure out how did indigenous cultures of the past grow food on the same land year after year after hundreds of years and still grow quality food. And so I embarked on a search to figure out that 
uh, how, the ways in which they did that. And uh, that culminated in um, uh, teaching at my wife's school, the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition, the gardening portion of that. And then that culminated in, in putting together a recipe book. Um, I felt it was really important for people to understand and, and to be able to share these ideas. Um, I became very empowered by the knowledge that I could make mineral and biological amendments in my backyard for free or just about no money and, um, and grow healthy plants and provide the plants all they, they needed, both biologically and minerally. Um, and so um, I retired and published this book and am now um, trying to share these ideas, these recipes with other people so that they can no longer purchase things in a store and support that industry, but rather be empowered themselves to use uh, the materials around their home in their local uh, um, environment um, to grow healthy foods. And so um, Pandora has asked me to uh, put together a, a package of information uh, about these subjects. And um, so that's what I've done. And so um, I'm gonna switch to PowerPoint now and I'm gonna show uh, some slides and there'll be a few videos in there as well. And I'll come back to this view and answer questions periodically through the presentation to uh, try and facilitate uh, a, um, a conversation about the questions that you may have about the material that I'm going to present. Okay. Um, as I like to say, ready, set, go. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll go here and we'll do that and that. Share. We'll close that. Cancel. Uh, close that. Close that. Okay. And all right. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. Okay. So, um, the topic of this conversation is regenerative gardening, and and specifically sustainable growing methods. And I'm gonna speak about um, some of those today. So the first thing that I've recognized in having conversations with people about sustainable agriculture and regeneration is there needs to be a model within which to have that context. So I'm gonna talk about a model first, and this will provide the framework for all other discussions that we might have about growing in the garden. And then specifically, I wanna talk about homemade mineral amendments. Uh, once we understand this plant model and we understand what we can do and what we should do to nurture our soils, then we quickly move to, well, how do I do it? What do I do now kind of thing? And so this middle part of the conversation is going to be about making homemade mineral amendments and how to apply them. And um, there's long and, long and short term strategies on how to do this. And I'm going to focus specifically on some short term strategies. And then the third part of the third part of the discussion is going to be the use of a refractometer. One of the most important things to do in any undertaking is being able to measure what it is that you're doing, most measure the, uh, the benefits and the deleterious effects of what's going on. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce you to a refractometer and the use of a refractometer for measuring not only the fruits and vegetables that come into your home, so you can actually determine the quality or the health of the fruits and vegetables that you're eating, but also how to use this refractometer in the garden environment. So I always start off with something like this, and, and this is the soil plant model that many people use um, in order to uh, do their gardening. And this is the, the soil plant model that I used when I was young. Um, and it was very, very simple. The bottom line is you take a seed and you put it in the ground and you grow a plant and the plant grows and everything's great. And you reap the benefits of uh, the tomatoes or whatever it might be from this plant. And the cool thing about this model, despite, despite its simplicity, is it works. Most of us can put a seed in the ground and nature is so tenacious that the plant will grow and produce a tomato that's better than the one that we can purchase in the store. But I think we need something a little bit more sophisticated in order to understand 
um, why we're actually doing things in the garden. And that's the purpose of this soil plant model is to answer the questions, well, why am I doing this? And then once we have this model in our hand, we can do a better job at determining whether or not the actions we take in the garden or on the farm are beneficial or not. And so here is a little bit more sophisticated model. And, and in uh, um, uh, some of my uh, other programs, I spend a lot of time to talk about how complex the air and the water is that plants are introduced to. Um, I talk a, a lot about the electromagnetic radiation that plants are introduced to. The fact that we go around the sun in a year and the electromagnetic radiation that we that plants see varies throughout that year, not only because of the parts of the universe and all the different suns in the universe are shining on the plant, but also because of the reflections of planets and the moon uh, and their uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation that impinges on plants. And, and these kinds of ideas allow an understanding of the biodynamic calendar and things like that. And then another subject that's very seldom spoken about is the energy flows in, in plants. And uh, this is another thing that uh, is, is really not well talked about or understood that uh, deserves a lot of conversation. But for the purpose of today, I'm going to focus specifically on the rhizosphere. And that is the interface between the plant roots and the biology that's actually in the soil. And this is where a lot of stuff happens. And it's here that we can most influence um, what's going on as we grow fruits and vegetables. In fact, an understanding of this relationship between the plant and the soil um, in this rhizosphere forms the basis of understanding why we do many of the things that we do and why some of the things that we're doing in the garden may not be uh, um, beneficial. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the minerals that are in the rhizosphere. And most of us recognize that uh, NPK, because we're sold NPK, uh, that's uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium are required minerals. And sometimes we talk about potassium, uh, phosphorus, and uh, sorry, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, potassium. And so, uh, but we very seldom talk about all of the other minerals that are needed in the soil, specifically minerals like uh, cobalt and boron and molybdenum and manganese. And, and the, you can see the symbols on the left-hand side. And these are all of the minerals that uh, might be uh, in your soil or might not be, in, or you may have excesses. Um, and these are the minerals that are needed to grow healthy plants. And I put 16 or 18 minerals up there. And the reason for that is as, as we learn more and depending on the date of the periodical or uh, uh, source that you read, the number of minerals that we need increases. Um, I suspect those numbers will continue to increase as we become more sophisticated in our understanding of uh, the reactions and interactions in the soil. Well, your soil geology, your soil mineral content is basically defined by the local geology um, that is in the soil. And you can go back millions and hundreds of millions and perhaps billions of years um, in order to determine what minerals you have in your soil. And that pretty well is the foundation of the available minerals in your soil, both uh, excesses and deficiencies um, that any geological area in the country has. And here in the United States, we can actually use geological survey maps to determine the uh, mineral content of our soils. Um, uh, there are many documents that the US government has put out to define several minerals, many minerals in our soils by state and actually by locations in the state um, that are of value there. So that's one resource that you can use. So now we have a, a basic understanding of the minerals that are put there and now we have leaching that occurs by the, uh, the rainfall and the snow that falls in your, in your reason and region. And uh, some of these minerals are water soluble like boron and sulfur. And those minerals will leach out with rain and snow and things like that. The next thing is the management of the land itself and, and what you're actually growing and removing from the soil itself. Um, if we have uh, specific crops that are growing and we pull them out of the ground and we take the roots and the stems and the leaves, as well as the fruits out with them, we are removing minerals from the soil uh, by doing that. Um, there's also the addition of fertilizers and chemicals 
that are uh, being added to the soil and runoff and, and, and all of the other things that take place. So a lot of this mineral availability is based on these, these practices or past practices that have taken place for the last hundred years, if, if you think about um, agriculturally in, in many of our soils. The bottom line is that most of our soils have mineral imbalances. We either have too much or too little of many minerals. And some of that is because of the fact that we put the same chemicals on our soils year after year and we build up uh, excesses, or we never understand what minerals are in our soil. And so we have uh, deficiencies um, uh, based on the fact that they were just never there. And back in the day, several hundred years ago, when food wasn't trucked all over the world, the health of a community was pretty well defined by the local soil and the food that was grown there. Because the food that you ate was grown within the uh, a local area, and that pretty well defined your health. And in fact, we can track the rise and fall of great civilizations uh, by their food quality and their demise in food quality. And that brings to light uh, the United States and our continued decline in health. Um, I think we're ranked 70 something in the ind industrial world in health, despite the fact that we spend so much on healthcare. Um, there's another uh, conversation that we could veer off into if we were so interested. Um, so the minerals um, have proportions that are um, important, specifically when growing cultivated plants. And many of you may have heard of the likes of William Albrecht or Carrie Reams, uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the giants in agriculture in the in the middle of the last century um, that uh, talked about these very important subjects and had a lot to say about them. Um, William Albrecht spent an awful lot of time working on and defining the, um, the proportions of minerals that are needed in the soil in order to grow healthy cultivated plants. And um, I'll mention one at the top of the list and that's calcium. And we see that the target amount of calcium uh, is 68% in, uh, in the table on the left-hand side. Well, that's a very interesting amount. I mean, if you look at all the minerals there, calcium seems like a really big hitter. And, and one of the reasons for that is calcium is a really big molecule and that will open the air up to aer aeration so that the uh, air can get into the soil and water will flow and, and get into the very small uh, interstitial spaces within the uh, the soil network uh, and, and be stored and, and not run off. And when I say calcium is a large molecule, um, I like to use an example of, imagine all of us that we're in a room and we're in a room of a finite size and uh, we're all some of these molecules uh, on the left-hand side of this table. Well, the, the difference between calcium and several of the other molecules here, the elements in here, is that the calcium compound has very large size. It has, it's a very large molecule. So you can imagine if we're all in the room and some of us are like magnesium with our arms straight down and, and, and very close together, calcium is the molecule that has its hands spread wide apart and so taking up a lot of space. And so this allows for the aeration of soil and water flow in it. So that's one of the reasons that calcium is such an important uh, uh, molecule, uh, mineral in the, in the soils that we have. The next thing is recognizing that some of these minerals need very, very small amounts. When we look at the uh, elements at the bottom of the list, the uh, boron and the cobalt, molybdenum, selenium, and nickel, they're wanting to be in very, very small amounts, 1.5 part per million, uh, uh, 0.5 part per million. And so when I first started reading about all of this, I was really struck by the fact that, well, geez, if I do a soil test, which I did, and I find out I'm short of, let's say, cobalt, for instance, how the heck am I going to find cobalt? And how am I going to spread cobalt at one part per million over my entire garden? Now, let's say I'm a farmer with thousands of acres. How am I going to spread cobalt at one part per million uh, throughout this very large size? And so this was a really daunting uh, uh, idea for me. And I really struggled with it for quite a while. And I'll tell you in a little bit how I got around that. I'll actually show you. The other thing about these minerals is that they have to be in very specific forms for plants to access them. So let's say I had a, uh, a, a box or a jar of cobalt in a powdered form, a rock form. 
well, how am I going to, first I have to distribute it over this large area. And then the next thing I have to do is figure out how the, the, the plant can actually access it. So that, that cobalt has to get into a form that the plant can actually access. And so how is that going to take place? And, and how do I make sure that that happens? So these were very daunting questions for me as I tried to understand the mineral requirements of the rhizosphere. And then the next thing I started to run into, and this was the beginning of opening my eyes to the fascination of the natural world, was the recognition that these mineral proportions were what cultivated crops needed optimally to grow in. But weeds, on the other hand, grew in unbalanced soils, and they bring minerals from the soil below and bring them up to the surface, and then they die annually, and they deposit those minerals onto the surface of the ground. The actual content of the minerals in those plants are not the same as the mineral proportions in the soil. So the weeds were actually bringing minerals from the soil in a different proportion that were in the soil and laying them on the top of the ground. Well, this added an entire new dimension for understanding what's going on in our growing spaces that was just fascinating to me. The first one was recognizing how cool weeds are and how useful weeds might be. And we'll talk about those characteristics in a little bit. But it also gave me an idea um, and, and using some of the books that I managed to run across that we can actually determine information about the weeds, uh, about the minerals that are in our soil by the weeds that grow there. In fact, you can find some books um, that actually bring this out. And uh, in the back of uh, uh, the, my book, there's a laundry list of references and uh, there are references in there for these sorts of books. So observing weeds really helps understand soil mineral content and recognizing that weeds have different mineral compositions in there turns out to be a very useful characteristic. One of the coolest things about understanding the growing environment and using these models is the recognition that you will actually watch the weeds change as you start mineralizing your soil. In other words, you have a garden and all these weeds are prolific and growing in there. You start adding minerals to your soil and changing the mineral composition of the soil and the weeds that grow there will actually change. And as you bring things into a more cultivated uh, mineral specific proportions and have a thick layer of biology, of sorry, of um, humus, of compost, of, of carbon on the top of the soil, you can eliminate weeds. So the, one of the things here is the lesson that we have the opportunity by working with our soil, we can actually eliminate the, uh, uh, the pressure of weeds. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and say, any comments or questions? Well, that's fascinating that you can tell what the soil needs by what weeds are growing. That's something I want to look into. Yes. I've noticed that here in the Pacific Northwest, um, it seems like we're really short on calcium. And so I'm saving eggshells. Hey, Nigel, do we want to do raise hands for this or? Um, if you'd like to monitor that, that would be fine. It's up to you. You're, you tell me what's good for you. Okay, yeah, let's do raise hands. So, um, oh, sorry, I raised the wrong hand. <laughs> <laughs> one I didn't know which one. We're going to be talking about actually using those eggshells in a little bit. Yeah, the, uh, if you go down to the bottom where it says reactions, you can do a virtual hand raise down there. Okay, yeah, Stephanie? So um, I'm crazy enough that I sometimes grow weeds on purpose. So it sounds like from what you're saying, I shouldn't mix them up like I've been doing. Is that right? No, I, I think growing weeds uh, um, in, is a really wise idea. Um, and it's wise for many, many reasons. One is you're keeping the soil covered with plant and you're gonna learn in just a little bit why that's so important. And also you have a diversity of plants that are on your soil, which is very important. And you are facilitating nature when you have the weeds growing on your garden rather than trying to fight nature. So okay. I encourage people to grow weeds. And the other thing about weeds is some of the weeds out there are some of the most nutritious foods we have the opportunity to eat. Right, that's why I'm growing them. Yeah, thank yep. you. 
And Elizabeth? Yes, I just wanted to ask if, um, is there a website that you can share where we can find the geological service maps? Um, I can. It's actually, if you look at the, in, in my, the bibliography of my book, here, I got it open. Uh, so uh, let me answer two questions. First is, one of the best books I found on, on weeds is a book by Jay McCammon. It's called Weeds and Why They Grow. And um, he self-publishes his book. Um, and I'm going to give you a phone number that you can call to get it. It's 616-636-8226. Uh, and 10 bucks says somebody would like me to repeat that. Please. So I will. His name is Jay McCammon, M-C, capital C-A-M-A-N, and his phone number is 616-636-8226. You can tell him that Nigel sent you. And what was the name of the book again? I'm sorry. It's called Why, sorry, Weeds and Why They Grow. It's got a tremendous set of data in it, and it talks about uh, for any specific weed or plant, what the mineral uh, composition uh, might be for that. It's a really fascinating book and it's very useful in another way. And then to answer your question, um, you can just go on to the geological survey site, but one of the books that, uh, that I found very helpful was, let me see if I can find it quickly. Some reason it's not going to stick out at me. James Duke. So I don't see it off the top of my head. Um, so I'll have to try and get back to you with that. But geological survey is, is a really great resource. Um, and if you use your search engine for minerals in the United States, um, I think these sorts of resources will come up. The, the other thing you can do is do a soil test. The bottom line is you're going to get general information from the geological survey. Um, but uh, if you um, do a soil test, you're going to get a more definitive uh, indication of what's going on in your direct backyard. So I recommend a soil test, if nothing else. And uh, I do my soil tests at Log Logan Labs, if, if that helps. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, we got a... A nice heart showing up. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, so, yeah, that's it. That's. Do you want to go to uh, your second uh, section yep. there, Nigel? Absolutely. Here we go. Okay. So that's minerals. So the next thing I want to talk about is the biology in the soil, and this is where things get really, really fun. Um, most times people don't even think about the biology in the soil or they, they think of it secondly or thirdly or they've heard of it kind of thing. Um, so the, the bottom line here is that the soil is the plant's digestive system. And just like us, we have a load of bacteria in our guts that is essentially responsible for digestion. In fact, uh, if you look at the DNA of our cells, we're mostly biology and, and only about 5% human. Um, and so the soil is no different. It has huge amounts of bacteria, fungus, and archaea in the soil um, that acts as the fundamental digestion system of many of the, uh, the organic compounds as, re as well as the inorganic compounds. Uh, and they are able to break these things up and put them into forms that plants use. Um, it was fascinating for me to learn that despite their greater than millions of species of bacteria and fungus, we only know the names of 10% of them. And that just leaves so much un, unanswered questions and, and unknowns about the different bacteria and fungi that are actually in our soils. And then archaea is another one. Maybe many of you haven't even heard that word, um, but archaea was a new life form that was identified in the 1990s. It was first identified in the geysers at Yellowstone Park um, in environments that nobody thought anything could live, you know, high temperature sulfur environments. Um, and then it was found at the bottom of the oceans in vents uh, with no light and, and again, uh, non-oxygen environments. 
And at that time, they was, it was thought to be a bacteria. Um, come to find out that it wasn't, and it wasn't until the mid-90s that it was actually identified as a new life form. And the, uh, um, the listing of, of life forms had to be changed to include this brand new life form called archaea. Archaea has since been identified as being ubiquitous in our soils and responsible for fundamental things like fixing nit nitrogen and, and, and other functions in the soil. Uh, so it's really an amazing kind of conversation when we think about how much we really don't know about what's going on in the soil. And when we don't know about them, that means we don't know much about their biological functions or the interactions before, between all of these life forms that are in the soil. Um, and of course, all of these life forms, archaea and, and, and bacteria and fungi, they are food sources for protozoa and nematodes and some of the next higher um, animals on, the, uh, on this food chain. And of course, those will then feed the anthropods, gastropods, and uh, slimes, and algaes, and earthworms. And uh, now we get into the, some of the things that we can actually see in our gardens. So we quickly recognize that this soil biology is an amazingly diverse ecosystem. Um, and I argue that there's more going on in a foot square, a cubic foot of soil in your backyard than any of us will ever comprehend in our entire life, um, just because of this uh, amazing diversity uh, that's taking place in the soil. And the other thing is that many of the agricultural practices that we are using on a daily basis, not only agribusiness, but also us as gardeners or farmers in our backyard, work to deplete the biological diversity in our soils. You're going to learn in a minute that these plants actually feed the uh, uh, plants actually feed the biology in the soil. And so when we have a monoculture environment with no weeds and just lines and lines of one plant with nothing else around, we have eliminated much of the diversity that this soil would otherwise have relied on uh, for functions and interactions. Um, never mind tilling and then leaving the soil bare. When we till the soil, we have disrupted all of the uh, ecosystems that are in the soil. And then when we talk about um, uh, fungi, which rely on these long strands of mycelium, uh, and they just get cut up and destroyed. We're actually destroying fungi at an amazing rate when we till. And then when we leave the soil bare, that soil is exposed to sunlight, it dries out, and further destroys the, the soil ecosystem that uh, um, we're relying so much on. And then I, I put the sides, whether it's pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, um, these are just, just silly things to use. They're just crazy um, uh, uh, killings of things. And uh, several, most of us, uh, we, we have good intentions and we're, we're merely trying to get rid of the, uh, the white fly or the, uh, the aphid or whatever it is that's in our garden. So we go to the store and we buy an insecticide or a herbicide or a pesticide, depending on what it is we're trying to kill. And most of us think, I have a plant model that, well, we're just killing that one bug. But in fact, that's not true. These sides, whether they're herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides, or any of the other kinds of chemicals out there, they're in fact killing large percentages or parts of the ecosystem, not just that one bug or one thing that, um, that uh, people are worried about. And so despite intentions, when we use these things and practice these different methodologies, we're, we're actually uh, killing um, uh, uh, many aspects of the soil ecosystem, the soil biology. One thing about fungi that's really fascinating is the largest living thing on earth turns out to be a honey mushroom. And it was identified out in the West Coast occupying hundreds of square miles of real estate. And all these mycelium are just working underneath the ground, uh, creating these networks of, uh, of, of communication and conversation uh, within the soil ecosystem. Um, we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute. Anyway, it's all this soil biology that converts those minerals that we were just talking about into forms that plants can use. And this is just a, a wonderful plant model uh, identifying thing that we need to consider when we're doing things uh, around the yard. So I like to say there's no such thing as good or bad biology, but only balance. And when you start thinking about this, it makes sense. Um, it's only because of imbalance of the ecosystem in the soil that those certain uh, uh, fungi or 
black bacteria uh, rear their ugly heads and cause such a problem. Uh, they have simply been put into an environment, whether enough food or living conditions, where they have the opportunity to thrive where others will not. And so just like in society, by keeping quote unquote pathogens in check is by having that diverse and, and uh, um, uh, diverse ecosystem in the ground. And one of the things that I like talking about um, is the way to keep pathogens in check is by providing a plethora of biology to that situation in order to have the biology that's out of check have to compete. And um, by having to compete with all of the other biology that keeps those pathogens in check. So that's a fundamental plant soil model uh, uh, pre precept that can be used when trying to deal with um, uh, pathogens going forward. The overlapping biological functions of uh, a diverse biological system is what keeps the robustness of a soil working. Um, if one faction of a, of, of a very robust biological system falls apart, then there are other parts of that biological system that can take up the slack, if you will, and um, provide uh, um, uh, a situation to keep those uh, pathogens from being out of check and causing problems. And so um, it's this diversity that we want to work for in our soils in an effort to uh, maintain the digestive system for the plants, but also maintain a balance of the ecolog ecolog ecological system itself uh, going forward. Um, kind of an aside is, is recognizing how amazing this soil ecosystem is in, for more, in forming not only a communication network, uh, but also the sharing of nutrients within the soil. It's just fascinating to read uh, the work of Susan Samard, uh, I believe her name is. She works out of the University of British Columbia, if I'm not mistaken. And her research has shown that different trees in forests um, will actually share nutrients between species, depending on who's doing well and who's not doing well, um, recognizing that the entire ecosystem uh, needs to thrive in order for any one species to survive. And also uh, recognizing the, uh, um, the common release of uh, um, uh, of compounds when environmental pressures uh, happen to upon a, a field or a forest or some other ecosystem. Uh, this community, the, the, the arrival of a, a pest, whether it be a, a biological or an insect, is communicated uh, throughout a, a forest or another ecosystem, and all of the plants within that ecosystem get the signal and will put forth a common response. And the common response provides some benefit to the entire ecosystem against those pressures that might be, um, might be uh, put forward to that ecosystem. And so the soils provide the plants with the nutrients that they need um, by um, this overlap within the system. So the next thing is, is understanding where, how this biological, biological system actually works and not only decomposing organic matters, but also uh, inorganic uh, uh, materials from uh, uh, things in the soil and mobilizing these nutri nutrients into plant available forms and what's sometimes referred to as the soil uh, solution. It's amazing to think about this ecosystem and recognize that when you start at the very bottom of the system with the uh, fungi, archaea and bacteria, what they're doing is digesting uh, uh, and decomposing these organic and inorganic materials and they store them within their bodies. And so their bodies themselves become the nutrients for the next level of the biology in the soil to digest um, and, and move up the, uh, the food chain, if you will. And so all of the poop and dead bodies of all of these uh, fauna in the soil become part of the soil solution and provide higher and higher order compounds that uh, uh, the soil uh, can use and the plants can use uh, to grow. And then now we get to another absolutely fascinating portion of the soil biology that I learned uh, uh, that just really, really floored me. And that is the recognition that the plants themselves actually feed the soil biology. This was just amazing to me to read and understand that the plants will actually exude through the roots foods in the form of sugars that they create during photosynthesis to feed the biology of the soil. And they'll feed as much as 25% of the nutrients that they create in photosynthesis to the soil. 
Now in nature, when nature starts giving food away like that, there's something going on here because in nature, that doesn't happen. Things are really too scarce, sparse in nature for anything living to actually give up that much food. Um, and so the question on the table is, well, what's going on? Why would the plants feed so much of the energy that their hard earned energy in photosynthesis to the soil bio biology? And the answer is that by feeding the soil biology, the soil biology will then return plant nutrients to the plant and they will return the nutrients that they need. The fact that plants selectively feed the biology populations in the soil, feeding those biologies that are going to provide them with the nutrients they need, that's just mind-bendingly cool. I just love that. Um, What's really furthering that conversation is the fact that nutrients change during the plant's life, just like they do for us as, as an animal, as a human. Um, we need different nutrients when we're infants than we do them when we're teenagers, than we do when we're reproducing, than we do them when we're older. Um, and so the same is true for a plant. They actually have different uh, nutrient needs as they go through their life cycle. And the, the root exudates that the plants will actually feed the soil change to facilitate those nutrients that they need. They actually are feeding different uh, bacteria, archaea, nematodes, uh, uh, fungi in an effort to provide them the nutrients they need throughout their growing season. This is just an absolutely fantastic idea that needs to be understood when we're thinking about what to do next in the soil to grow our high-end food. Um, it also gives a little bit of information about companion planting. Most of us have heard about complanting plant planting, uh, that knowing that uh, different plants like to grow with other plants. And this gives some insight as to why that's true. Plants that like to grow with other plants are probably feeding similar aspects of the soil biology that actually increase the amount of nutrients that both plants are getting. These, this is when we come up to the idea that one plus one does not equal two, but one plus one equals 10. As we, uh, we get into uh, uh, um, exponential improvements in situations by the, uh, the addition of uh, simple ideas within the soil structure. Um, so the bottom line here is that a thriving soil biology is required to grow healthy plants. You cannot grow healthy plants unless you have the minerals that the soil needs and you have the biology that the soil needs in order for it to grow those healthy plants. And so the soil health is really defining plant health, which is defining our health. And this is why this plant soil model is so important. We have to understand that in to order to grow healthy plants for ourselves, we need to have a healthy soil so that the plant can become healthy as well. And now we understand, I'm going to explain why that is. So now we have compounds being provided by the soil ecosystem to the plant itself. So when higher, higher order compounds are actually provided to the, to the, um, sorry, my battery's going to die. Here we go. So now that the, we understand that these compounds are actually being provided to the plants, the plant recognizes that it no longer has to make some of these compounds. And so now it all of a sudden provides, is provided with extra energy or energy it can use for other tasks. Well, what happens when you or I get extra compounds, extra food that we don't actually need for our uh, uh, primary metabolisms and primary health? Well, we call that fat or lipids and we store that fat on our body. Well, the same is true with a plant. And so as these compounds are created and as the plant has extra energy to do other things when the first thing it does is actually puts lipids onto its leaves. Now, many of you have seen nice, shiny, uh, thick leaves on your tomatoes, for instance, or your peppers or whatever plant that might mean. And what's going on there is you are recognizing that that plant is increasing its health and it's actually able to put those lipids or those fats onto the leaf. And what happens with that now is that airborne pathogens that would otherwise land on the leaf itself and be able to penetrate the leaf structure and, and cause a problem in the plant no longer can do so because that pathogen lands on the lipids, on the fats, and has to penetrate through the fat layer before it can even get to the leaf. That's pretty cool.
And so at the end of the summer, when your squash plants are all of a sudden suffering from powdery mildew, it's not because the powdery mildew just showed up. That powdery mildew had been there all the time. What's happened is your plant no longer has the energy, it has the minerals or has the compounds, the soil structure, in order for it to create those lipids and keep that fat layer on the surface of the leaf. And so now it becomes susceptible to the pathogens of uh, powdery mildew that land on the leaf and cause trouble with the plant. That's cool. So if we take this one step further, now our plants are actually increasing the sugar content as these compounds come in from the soil and this relationship between, between the soil and the plant continues to grow. And as the, plant sap, as the plant sap sugar increases, then insect pressure no longer becomes a problem. This is fantastic. The reason insects eat plants is because the plants are unhealthy and it doesn't have the high sugar content in the plant sap that enables it to digest it. In fact, plants with low sugar content give off infrared radiation. This is a signal to every insect in the county that says, come and eat here. And when the sugar content rises, the insects no longer have the ability to digest those sugars. They don't have the enzymes in their gut to digest the complex sugars that are in the plants. And so they just plain old don't eat them anymore. They're no longer a food source. So you don't need insecticides to protect your plant. You need a healthy plant that protects itself. And then here we go. Here's the top level. Now we're talking about the secondary metabolites of plants. And secondary metabolites are the metabolites, the compounds that plants don't need for survival, but the plants they make when they're really, really healthy. These are the antioxidants, phytonutrients, and phenolics, and things like that, that plants uh, uh, are able to create and that we want to eat. Now, you might think of blueberries, for instance. Well, why do you eat blueberries? Well, I eat blueberries because of the antioxidants that are in those blueberries. Well, guess what? If you don't have a healthy blueberry plant, those antioxidants aren't going to be in the fruit. The only way you're going to get antioxidants in your blueberries is if the plant was healthy enough to have all of this stuff going on so that it could create those secondary metabolites, those antioxidants. And so this is the coolest idea of all when the soil plant model is that not only is there an interaction between the plant and the soil biology, but the soil biology, the plant is feeding the soil biology and the soil biology is providing the plants with compounds that it needs so that it can actually create those lipids. It can correct, actually increase the sugar content of the plant itself and create these secondary metabolites that we're looking for, for health. All right. There you go. So I'm going to stop there and ask if there are any questions. No questions. No, I don't see any. <laughs> Everybody knew all that. No, but it's fascinating. Oh, there's a there are two SMA. hands raised. Yeah, two SMA hands raised. has a hand. Uh, Rosa Hi. Hi. I was wondering about the sides. You were talking about the insecticides, fungicides, all of that. If I were to use an organic side, would that still cause the damage that you're speaking of? Well, um, it depends on what it is for sure. And without any more information, it would be difficult for me to understand what the actual uh, compound you're using is. But in short, if you're killing something, there's a probability you're killing more than whatever it is that one thing that you think you're killing is. Um, so um, I would- Specifically I would, the like the, the copper fungicide options um, for on leaf treatment, foliar treatment. Right, so, uh, so like copper sulfate, for instance? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's used on fruit trees in the wintertime to try and get rid of funguses and things like that and, and other pathogens. Um, so I choose not to use those things. Um, I, I'm not interested in um, um, purchasing copper sulfate. Um, I don't know where it's mined. I don't know what the, uh, uh, how sustainable it is. I don't know uh, uh, the treatment of the people that are actually doing it. Um, so I tend to not want to use those things, and I would use other techniques in order to uh, try and help my tree. 
or plant. Um, now that I, uh, you know my in, uh, interpretation of a plant model, that tree is suffering from malnutrition somehow. And by increasing the nutrition of the plant, um, you can uh, do better um, at uh, preventing the problems that that plant might have. Um, so I'm not sure what that copper sulfide does um, to uh, uh, anything else, but I do know that copper is a needed mineral. Uh, you want uh, on the order of four parts per million copper in your soil. Sulfur is a, a very important mineral and it's water soluble. So there's a high probability that that's going to leach away and go somewhere else other than wherever you're spraying it. Um, but if it goes in the soil and you're short on sulfur, if you've got a lot of rain, that's probably a good thing. So when I think about um, uh, the use of copper sulfide, I try and use this plant model. I try and understand, well, if I'm thinking about being sustainable, right? Then I think about not just the thing I buy in the store and the fact that it costs money, but I'm thinking about the other aspects of uh, where that came from and the cost of actually using it. And then I'm thinking about, well, where does it actually go? Um, and, and how else does it affect the ecosystem uh, around me? Thank you very much. Yeah, Cecilia? Did you have a question, Cecilia? Yes, I do. And it's it's based off of what Esme said, because um, we have, we this is our first year farming. And after 60 plus years of chemicals, we were inundated with worms and all kinds of stuff. And so of course the vineyard is full of, of aphids and same thing, we chose not to spray and but we made it through through the wine process just fine. However, our green chili, we lost 25% of our plants to a worm and then it went into the alfalfa. So we sprayed BT, we've been using soap and salt vinegar mixes. So same thing as what Esme said, what impact does that have on the biology down below? Because we just did this to keep our head above soil or right. above water. Yeah, so the transition from what most people do today to a regenerative and sustainable uh, growing environment is is a challenge um, and it's probably beyond the scope of the conversation but uh, to uh, try and answer specific questions uh, about your practices um, so bt is not going to do anybody any good um, and um, so i would suggest that 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 may have gotten you over over a short term but it's not going to help you long term Correct. and so the 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 easy answer is to try and understand what your soil is like and how do you nurture that soil to bring it back to health. And um, there's a laundry list of things to do. And I'm going to show you a couple of them short term uh, okay. in the going forward in the use of foliar sprays um, and providing the minerals that your plants need. And you can also do some of these techniques using some biology too. Um, but I think that you'll find uh, some of the solutions that I'm going to recommend in a little bit here to be very useful for your environment. And I would recommend that you pursue those things in trying to nurture your plant, provide the plant with the minerals it needs and try and increase the health of your soil biology as well. So that's gonna be the short answer. How do, I, how do you uh, improve your soil biology and how do you provide plants with the minerals that they need? Okay, and one more question that goes along those same lines. How many years is that going to take us? Because- yep. That's you know, our concern, like I said, 60 plus years of, of the NPK and the NPK and the NPK every year. So yep. now we're trying to come out of that and, and it's no longer soil as much as it is dirt. And right. so, yeah, so that's, that's my next question is how long is this going to take? So that's a really, in, a really easy answer to question with a not so satisfying answer. <laughs> and, and that is, it depends, right? Isn't that the classic answer? Always. Always. And so it depends on where you are now and what you do to move yourself forward. But okay. um, my personal suggestion is you need to add um, as much carbon as you can to that environment and enough. Uh, and so that carbon is the is the housing and food for the biology in that soil. And then short term using foliar sprays along the line of what you're going to hear today uh, to provide amendments to those uh, to your plants going forward. Okay, thank you, Nigel. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I am living in a in a suburban environment, um, been here 
uh, I'd say something like eight years now, um, surely for us, as is evident from what we saw with the landscaping, it was a lot of the, you know, roll out lawns and obviously lots of chemicals were used here. Um, we've done a whole lot of, of re-landscaping in terms of putting in, um, taking all the grass out, putting a lot of mulching in and so on. I've had a huge amount of difficulty um, with my plants not doing very well, not being very healthy, kind of stunted or, or bolting. But the biggest problem I've had is the watering. And I'm, I'm convinced that it has, there's possibly, um, it, there's a huge amount of porosity. So every time I'm trying to enrich my soil with, um, with mulches and seaweed and all kinds of other um, natural components, I, I'm feeling like it's washing away because I've, I'm getting nowhere. I mean, I, I use, as you say, it takes a long, long time and I realize that. But after doing this for easily the past five or six years, um, I help, <laughs> I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah, so um, the you, you mentioned all the right stuff, all the right minerals, but uh, you're missing biology. You didn't say biology, and and that's the big deal. And it's the biology that's going to flip that switch for you. And uh, um, so there are some biological recipes in in this book. Uh, one of them is leaf mold biology. It's very easy to make uh, for just about free. And then you can get into some more complex ones like IMO, uh, indigenous microorganisms, is indigenous microorganisms along the Korean natural farming uh, methodologies. Um, and then the question is, well, what did they put that turf down on? And so what's actually underneath that turf might be of very good interest to you. Um, it might be worth digging a hole and uh, doing a soil test and, and just examining the soil underneath that turf uh, to figure out what's under there. And, and my guess is it's probably not very nice. Um, yeah, I mean, basically what we're dealing with is, is a, a, a pretty kind of white so I came from the Willamette Valley, so it's very, very frustrating because it's by no means the same soil. Um, but it, it, it's definitely very, very rocky, um, especially large. It's kind of a combination of large boulders and, and sandy. It appears clayey, but it doesn't behave like clay at all. It drains very, very fast. And right. so that's why as much as these amendments are happening, and I'd love to do some of these biology recipes that you're talking about, but my concern is it's going to wash away. So how yeah. do we get it? to become um, more saturated. Yep, so um, carbon is your friend. Um, and I, I don't, in that environment, you, I don't think you can add enough carbon to that environment um, because one of the things that that biology is gonna need is housing. And uh, housing comes in the form of humus, uh, which is essentially a, a fairly stable form of carbon. Um, so uh, I think you have a, a difficult situation, but um, I don't think it's, it's insurpassable, but um, adding carbon in the form of humus or just about anything you can get, crushed leaves, com compost, anything you can get is going to provide uh, the housing that that biology needs. And also that humus um, will affect the, uh, the rate of water uh, leaving your, your, your soil. Um, yeah, I would definitely do a soil test too just to figure out um, at least where you are in, in the calcium magnesium ratio, which will also affect your soil tilt. Great, thank you. Yeah, Cheryl, did you have a question? Uh, yes, so in moving forward with the presentation and talking about uh, the recipes, uh, and applications. I'm in an urban environment and so much of the work I do is raise beds and containers and so just the nuance of how to work with these recipes in that type of medium and you know what the differences are of just you know being on a farm and you know spreading these materials in a large scale as opposed to the container model and what the differences are. Yeah, that's a really great question, Cheryl. And I get uh, a, a lot of inputs like that. Um, in fact, I'm just about to launch a um, uh, Zoom conversations that'll take place in, in the end of January, beginning of February, um, where I try and differentiate uh, the garden experience from the farm experience from the urban experience. Um, a lot of people, they'll take my class and they, you know, they say, hey, that's a great idea, Nigel, but guess what? I live in, in LA and, you know, I've got a cement and tar next to me. There's no woods. Where do I find leaf mold biology? 
Uh, so those are really great questions. Um, and, and they're not insurmountable, um, but they do, as you point out, they, they require a different set of solutions than uh, the farm or the backyard. Here in New England, I mean, things are green and lush and, and beautiful uh, at, in comparison. Um, so uh, uh, that's a little bit beyond our conversation today, but there, there is an opportunity for you to learn more about that, at least through my website, if you're interested in checking that out. Okay, Speaking I will for sure. Speaking specifically about raised beds and containers, um, when you do that, you have sort of circumvented the soil model relationship that I just mentioned. Um, no longer is this, you, do you have this vast soil ecosystem underneath your plants? And while there's still going to be a relationship of the plant feeding the soil microbes and the microbes giving back to the plant, it's not the same as if you're in uh, a garden or farm environment. Um, so there is a difference between container planting and raised beds, and um, suffice to say that those nuances can be imagined now that you understand this plant model and the interrelationship between the soil biology, the minerals, and the plants that actually grow in them. Um, I often ask people, well, why are you using raised beds? Or, well, why are you growing them in containers? And many people come back with very, very reasonable answers. Well, I live on a balcony in, in New York City. Uh, for instance, or um, I live in, 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 in LA and, and the land is, is terrible, all right? So there's a lot of good reasons for doing that. But the question now is, okay, so how do I take this plant model? Now you understand a little bit about what you're up against. How do I take that model and provide solutions for uh, that urban environment? And, and one of my goals is to facilitate that conversation and uh, from people around the world uh, and, and try and understand what different people are doing. Get a, a, a collection of people together that are working with these problems and understand these models and understand these conversations. And how can we put together solutions for uh, these situations that we can share around the world? Thank you. Welcome. Did we cover everyone's questions? Yeah. I did. Uh, I'm sorry, I just had a quick question. Um, I, I hear Nigel saying he will be sharing about um, recommendations um, um, or, uh, you know, to add to our, our plants. I was going to ask, um, would water, a mixture of water and sugar, would it be um, healthy or good for our plants? That's or a great question. Um, I'm going to talk about foliar sprays uh, in, in just a little bit here. And so we'll, we'll, I'm gonna talk about that in detail. Um, when you add just sugar to a plant, um, you're doing just that. You're adding uh, um, sugar to the plant, which may be helpful for the plant, um, but it may not be providing the minerals that the plant needs. So the easy answer is it depends. Um, and, and you might try that, but um, sugar in and of itself is providing energy to the plant but well, really what those plants need is minerals and compounds from the soil. Um, so um, I wouldn't recommend adding sugar itself unless there was a very specific reason for doing that. And there probably are good reasons for doing that. And, and um, I would invite you to try. One of the things that I like, I like to let people know is we're all experimental gardeners. There's so much that we do not know about the garden, about the soil, about the interaction between plants and the soil. And that's why I like to make that point early on in these conversations. And so it's important to, uh, to recognize that all of us might want to try whatever we have at our disposal and see what the result is. So I would answer your question is there's probably a good reason for doing that. Um, and, and that might be because the plant just needs a good kick to get it off the ground, for instance. Um, but uh, in the, in the gr grander scope of things, um, that's not something that I have done directly. I have not found an, uh, an instance where I needed to do that specifically. I was just wondering, uh, maybe it would, it would keep pests away? So um, it may, but it may not. It may encourage pests. Um, one of the things that pests uh, look for is the uh, nitrogen content within the leaf. Uh, you don't want to have any nitrates in your leaf. That's the thing that's sending off a signal to insects that come and eat me. And so by doing that, you may be raising the, nitri the nitrogen level uh, uh, in the leaf, and that might be making it more attractive to pests. So 
Um, I would not think off the top of my head that that would be a really great idea. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Nigel, um, did you want to share your next segment there? Yes, that's good. So I'm going to change gears here a little bit. That's the end of the soil plant model. And I'm going to move into um, the idea of long-term and short-term uh, uh, ways to regenerate uh, sustainably your soil. And I'm going to just touch really briefly, briefly on long-term solutions. And then I'm going to talk specifically about short-term solutions and the use of homemade mineral amendments um, and how easy and cost-effectively they are. I'm also going to show you a couple of videos of how to make vinegar extractions and how to make fermented plant juices. All right. All right, sure. Okay, so that's it for biology. So the next thing we come across is the recognition that most of our soils are not minerally balanced and um, are um, uh, not very biologically rich, and so they need help. And so the fact that our soils need help is recognition that our plants need help. And so many of us have, have already talked about situations where we're in this situation and the, and the, and the long and short is, well, so now what do I do? Um, and so we can talk about long-term strategies and these are the strategies of, of, reply, of, of applying rock dust, carbon and biologies to the soil in an effort to try and increase the health of the soil itself. And that's a whole big long discussion that we could dwell on for quite a while. Um, not only do we want to, and then when we think about increasing biology, we really have to think about other things as well. We have to think about the housing for that biology, and we have to think of the food for that biology, whether it's uh, in the form of sugars, whether it's in the form of uh, air uh, or, or other sorts of carbon um, and, and things like that. So long-term strategies are indeed that. And I make the, the, the point here that we're dealing with the real world here. And most of us in the United States and in many parts of the world are looking for silver bullets. We're looking for a pill or we're looking for that one thing that um, is needed to make things right. And I hope that uh, from listening to that discussion on the soil plant model, that we're talking about an ecosystem that we're trying to improve here. We're not talking about one thing. And so most of the time that silver bullet is non-existent and we have to address all of the uh, uh, things that are going on in a plant's life in the soil. Um, one of the analogies that uh, is often cited when we talk about minerals and in plants is that um, if we imagine a, a barrel and that's made of staves and each stave is a mineral that the plant needs, the health of the plant or the amount of water that's held in that barrel is going to be equivalent to the lowest stave. So you've got all the minerals, but it's that one mineral that's lacking the most that's going to define the health of, that, uh, of the plant or the amount of water in the barrel. And that's exactly what's going on when we start talking about ecosystems rather than talking about the silver bullet that might uh, uh, make things right, the pill that might make you healthy. And so now we quickly move to short-term strategies. And one of the most important short-term strategies is the use of foliar spray. And, and the idea that we can actually spray something onto the plant leaf and, and make a difference. And the reason that this works is because the plant actually has two different pathways uh, of plant sap. There's the xylem pathway where plant sap flows from the roots up into the plant and then out through the leaves in respiration. Uh, um, and, and this is something that uh, uh, is really interesting and fun to talk about. And then we also have the phloem pathway where uh, energy is actually created in the leaf through photosynthesis. Um, uh, and then the, uh, uh, that energy is then flowed through the phloem system through the sinks of the plant. And it actually flows to the most important of plants. It flows to the most important parts of the plant. And those are the new shoot growth um, that's occurring above the ground. It's occurring to the fruits or the seed of the plant or the flower of the seed for reproduction. It's uh, down into the root structure to promote new root growth. And then finally, that one that we just might have learned about is actually feeding the roots, the, the, the soil ecology through the root exudates. So I'll repeat that. There's four different places that uh, energy in the leaf goes to the new shoots, to the fruits and seeds and reproduction, flowers, 
to the root shoots growth and to feeding the soil itself. And so by providing the plant with foliar sprays directly onto the leaf of the plant, we have the opportunity to nurture our plant in real time as things go forward, despite the fact that things are whatever they are in your growing system. And this is what makes foliar spraying so important. The other thing about foliar spraying with the, uh, uh, the compounds that we're gonna be talking about is these are all in plant available forms and the plant has the opportunity to use them immediately um, within minutes or hours. Um, and then finally, I'll add that we talked about co copper sulfate being applied to plants in the middle of winter uh, to fruit trees and things like that as a way to uh, deter pathogens. Um, you can also foliar spray uh, plants that have, no bar that have no leaves on it, but only have bark on it. And 10 to 20% of the foliar spray will actually be absorbed through the bark, just like things are absorbed through our skin. So again, we see the analogy between ourselves and plants uh, whether it's the digestive system or the absorption through the spring, the string, the skin, um, and things like that. So what I'm going to focus on now is the ability of our cells to make locally sourced, low-cost mineral amendments and apply them as foliar sp sprays to the plants to give them the minerals that they need uh, throughout the growing season. And two of the recipes that uh, I put forward in my book are uh, vinegar extractions and fermented plant juice. And uh, these are amazingly simple recipes that you can make at home. I call it kitchen chemistry. Uh, so you're using kitchen tools that are very simple and, um, and making these things. Um, and in the case of vinegar extractions, the weak acid of the vinegar breaks down the constituents that are in the, uh, in the solution. And the results are water-based broad spectrum mineral amendments that are not only uh, shelf stable, so you can actually put them on your shelf, but they also are in forms that you can feed the plant directly. And then the other one is fermented plant juices. And in this case, we're using a sugar fermentation process to break down the plants and bring those minerals within the plants uh, into a solution that can also be used um, uh, to uh, feed the plants. And I'll just dwell on this again, because uh, I don't think I talk about this further on. Um, weeds, I think I do. Weeds uh, as being mineral accumulators that are in different forms that are, that are in the soil make wonderful um, uh, uses, make wonderful fermented plant uses. Um, and one of the things that was really fascinating to me was this whole idea that, so I'm in a garden and, and there are all these weeds growing in that garden. Well, the first thing that came to my mind is nature's growing those weeds to bring the soil mineral balance into, into line with what nature wants. And so the next thought I thought of was, why not use the weeds that are growing in my garden to make fermented plant juice and feed the garden? Because that's what nature's doing. That's what nature's trying to do. So here's an opportunity where we can actually nurture the soil and work in tandem with nature. In, we can be on the same page as nature by taking these weeds and actually feeding them back into the, the garden or farm environment um, uh, as a way to uh, give the plants or the, the soil ecosystem the minerals that it needs. And the other idea was the idea of fermenting the fruits that um, I'm growing uh, uh, to feed next year's crop. Um, I often like to talk about tomatoes. And so here I am at the end of the year of tomatoes. There's all kinds of tomatoes everywhere. There's some dead ones and brown ones and not so ripe ones. And why not take all of those tomatoes that I have and make fermented plant juice out of them to feed my tomatoes the following year? When you think about a plant, the absolute quintessential essence of the plant is its reproduction of next year's fruit. And so that tomato represents the quintessential effort of a tomato plant. Why not take advantage of that, knowing that that has all the minerals and nutrients and compounds and enzymes and all kinds of stuff that tomatoes need and want in them to make a fermented plant juice that I can use the following year to feed those tomatoes. The result of all of these fermentations and, and, and extractions is a water-based product that is, has those minerals in the forms that plants use. Remember, we were talking about uh, um, trying to figure out how to get cobalt. Well, guess what? What if we take a plant and ferment it, and all of a sudden we recognize that that plant has the cobalt we need in it to feed the plant directly. 
And so what I want to do now is I'm going to show you a couple of videos on how to make these vinegar extractions and fermented plant juices, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the details of them. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to open up that. And then I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to share this. So here's a little bit about, oh, sorry. Not the one I wanted. Can you see that? It's in a funky presentation. It's kind of weird. Very so good. I, I see the same thing. It's sort of frozen. Thank you. I, can you see my book? Yes. Very good. Here we go. Hello, I'm Nigel Palmer, and I'm the author of the book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments. This one. And this brief video is all about making fermented plant juice, which is one of the recipes in this book. Um, you'll also find a detailed analysis of the mineral composition of many of the fermented plant juice recipes that uh, I use in the garden. Um, yeah. Uh, fermented plant juice of dandelion. I've just got a bunch of dandelions and I'm just sizing up how much I want to make. So I just pick all these dandelions as I'm preparing a new bed from the garden. There's plenty available. I like dandelions in my garden. And I'm just cutting them up and filling up this jar. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now I'll weigh it and add an equal amount of sugar. Dandelion, I'll cut it. Ready? A pound of dandelion, a pound of sugar. And I like to mix these up. There we go. And then we'll fill the jar with the mixture. I like to do some layering while I do this. A little dandelion. Sugar, little dandelion. Little sugar, little dandelion. Just a layer of sugar on the top. I want sugar to be on the top. Perfect. This dandelion fermented plant juice is ready to be decanted. You can see there's a nice liquid in there. I take the small weight off. So for labeling, I just take this label off because I'm going to decant it into this jar. So now I'm going to decant. I'm going to use a a sieve to hold things in place and then literally just pour it in and I'll get it so that it balances and we'll just let that go just like that. I want to keep an eye on it while the first blobs go down so that it uh, doesn't become unstable. There we go. Go, here we go. Once it's decanted in the jar, um, I'll label it and put it on the shelf and have fermented plant juice of dandelion uh, at a dilution rate of a thousand or five hundred to one. Uh, this quart jar will last me quite some time. There we go. Now everything will be stable and uh, on inclined to just let it go from this point on. 
We'll come back and look at this later. See how it does. Now that you've made your fermented plant juice, you have about a quart of the liquid in a glass jar. Well, one quart may not seem like a lot, but when we dilute it 500 to 1, that's 500 quarts or 125 gallons of fermented plant juice mineral amendment. That'll go a long way. Not only that, it's shelf stable and it uh, will sit on the shelf for years. These fermented plant juices are multispectral. They have a very broad mineral composition. Uh, you can see the mineral composition of many of the fermented plant juices in the appendices of my book. The reason that these fermented plant juices have such broad spectrum mineral composition is because they're made from plants. How cool is that? Okay, there's one. And that's vinegar extractions. You have a question? Okay. I have a question. Um, I don't know if my computer froze or something happened, so I missed part of it. So after you put the sugar in the plant, did you add liquid or did you just press jam on it like you're making sauerkraut to get juice out of the plant? Yeah, the, it's the sauerkraut idea, but there's no jamming. Um, uh, you just put a light weight on the top and the it's actually that's very similar to making sauerkraut. You put a light weight on the top and what that does is it causes the uh, plant material to be um, underneath the liquid. And that's the goal. You want to have the plant material below the liquid. Otherwise, it'll get fuzzy and funky things happen. Okay. And so uh, Thank you. I usually put a, a glass or a, you can boil a rock. You can, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do, but a glass of water works. Um, be, be careful because sometimes that glass of water will go down a long way and you might never see it again. Uh, just kidding. Anyway, so, uh, and, and as and once the liquid becomes above the plant material, then you can um, either remove the glass or take the water out and lighten the weight. You don't want a heavy weight. You want just to make sure that the liquid is below the water, just like making sauerkraut. Thank you. Yeah, Cheryl, did you have a question? Yes, I have two questions. Uh, one is what is the minimum time for fermentation? And uh, what is what type of sugar can be used? And is molasses an option? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so those are the standard questions that I get. Um, so the one of the things that's really cool about this is you can get a mineral, mineral amendment in a week. It takes about seven days for that to take place. Um, the next question is, uh, what was it? Sugar. Ah, organic brown sugar. Um, I would not use molasses. Um, we're, we're very interested in the moisture content of the sugar and molasses has a very high moisture content. Um, molasses might be, um, um, somebody mentioned feeding their plant sugar in a foliar spray. Uh, molasses might be a sugar that you may consider doing that because molasses not only has that sugar content in it, but it has a very uh, large mineral content in it as well, as well as, as, well as sulfurs. So um, uh, molasses is one of the few sugars that you might want to spray on a plant in extremely small dilution rates. Uh, did I answer all your questions? I think you had one more. That was it. Okay, great. And all of that details uh, in, in, in the recipes. Yeah, yeah Cecilia? about honey? Yeah, so uh, I would not recommend honey either. Honey is okay. about, what, 18% moisture. That's pretty high moisture content, and it's a pretty <clears> valuable <throat> resource. I'd, I'd save my honey for feeding my bees. Okay. Um, or feeding it myself. Okay. Uh, although, <laughs> Thank you. Although, although it's a very mineral-rich product. and um, Yeah, that's that why I'm asking. Yeah, that might be something else to foliar spray your plants. I don't know. I, I, I'd try it. I, I have not tried it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Elizabeth? Yes. So once we have our magic juice, um, how much should we use to dilute like in a gallon of milk, empty gallon of milk? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Elizabeth? I didn't quite catch that. Yes, measurements. I'm asking about measurements. Like once we have our juice ready, yeah. how much of it should we dilute into, uh, let's say, an empty gallon of, of uh, milk? Very good. Um, so dilution rates are, are 1,000 to 1 or 500 to 1. 
so uh, let's see, how many tablespoons in a gallon of milk? So, well, so how, I put it this way. Uh, for a five gallon bucket, you put about a four gallons of water in it because you leave a gallon of space at the top because you want to mix it. And um, one tablespoon in four gallons is a thousand to one. Two tablespoons in four gallons is 500 to one. So I'll let you do the math. If you divide both of those by uh, four, you, you get your answer. Thank you. And, and Elizabeth, you were the one that was talking about sugar. So those honeys and those molasses, you know, those are a little bit different than just like sugar because they do have mineral content in them. Actually, uh, the honey's got all kind of wonderful things in it. Thank, thank you okay. for sharing. My pleasure. Okay. Um, shall I go to the next video? Yeah, so this, you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. This one uh, talks about uh, vinegar extractions. Uh, so we'll see how this one goes. Uh, let's see. Is that the one I want? I think that's the one I showed. Okay, that's the one I want. Oh, um, Nigel? Yes. Yeah, I just noticed somebody a while ago requested a break. Do, does everyone want to um, this take is a, great like time. A, a five minute break? If so, raise your hand. Okay, okay, it looks like we have enough. We should just take, um, what, five minutes? Sure, and if anybody wants to ask questions in the meantime, that's fine with me. Okay. I have a question about the storage of the vinegar extraction. Okay. Um, so you said that it's shelf stable. Does it need to be in a dark, cool place, kind of like essential oils? Yeah, that's a really good idea and a good question. Um, uh, you want it in a well-ventilated, dark place out of the sun um, and a nice room temperature, cool temperature would be desirable. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. Maybe I'll tell a story. Um, the person that really turned my head on all of this is John Kempf. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he is a remarkable person, human being, who is doing amazing things to the agricultural industry. But when I first heard him speak, he told stories of, um, he's a large scale farmer, a very large scale farmer, but he talked about um, situations where potato beetles were in potato fields and um, he uh, saw the potatoes that were eating the potatoes, the potato beetles eating potatoes and applying a foliar spray of nutrition, mineral amendments, if you will, um, to the field of potatoes and going back the next day and finding exploded potato beetles all over the ground. And what had happened is the potato beetles were eating the sugars of the plants um, and then got to a point where they just could not digest the sugars anymore and they fermented and caused the potato beetles to blow up. And, and it's these kinds of stories where you can actually watch the health of your plant increase um, um, by behaviors of insects um, in your garden or farm. You can also determine the health of a plant uh, by the type of insect that's eating your plant. They have a hierarchy where uh, uh, certain insects like aphids, for instance, will eat plants that have relatively low refractive index, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, those of about seven, whereas those insects that are chewing uh, um, will eat plants that have refractive indexes of closer to 12. And then once you get above that, um, you won't have insect pressure at all. And I'm probably going to repeat that, but I thought I'd throw that out for intermission comedy relief. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Can I ask a question or did you want me to wait until people got back from there? Oh, no. Yeah, go ahead. So um, you, you're talking about the, the uh, recipes that you're showing us now are mostly for, for foliar. Is that right? Um, you can also so, use these as drenches. Yeah, because I was going to say part of the, uh, the issue I'm having is getting this carbon into the soil because, as I say, in the process of trying to get it in, I have this feeling it's just washing away. And so it never really gets a chance to habitate there because it just disappears. So um, does it do any good to just put stuff on the top? Like, for example, you were talking about leaf molds and things like that, composting, or do I have to get it dug down into the roots where it can interact with itself? No, I'd say putting it on the top is a good idea. Um, you having a- Yeah, because I don't really want to disrupt the plants. They're already established and I don't really, you know, the whole idea of tilling and so on. And that's where I started thinking, well, like these, these sprays that you're talking about, can I just pour it on the ground so that it actually gets into the soil and will it, will it have the same effect there? Um, so the answer is you may drench, if you're familiar with that word, which is essentially watering. Uh, so you can either foliar spray or drench to apply these things. Um, when you drench, you're using a lot more of the liquid than you would when you're foliar spraying. So um, a little bit goes far less of a distance. And also, okay. you're going to suffer the same problems you're having when you're drenching, right? That water is going someplace, and it may or may it's not be going where you away. want it to go. Okay. So by putting it into the leaves, it'll then prevent that problem of it washing away because the plant itself will get it out into the soil. That's correct. And, and furthermore, now that you know that the plant is actually providing the soil ecosystem with 25% of the sugars it creates during photosynthesis, now right. you're recognizing that those carbons that are going into the soil are far more likely to get where you want them to go. Perfect. Love it. Okay, it looks like uh, most everyone is back. Do we want to continue? Okay, so I'm going to try and show you a video now um, about um, um, fermented plant uh, vinegar extractions. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, can you see my screen then? Yes. Very good, here we go. Hello, my name is Nigel Palmer and I'm the author of the book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments. In this short video, we'll explore making vinegar extractions using apple cider vinegar, organic apple cider vinegar. Vinegar extractions are really important because uh, not only do you get a broad spectrum mineral amendment with uh, just about any mineral you need or want in proportions that plants will like, but you also get high concentrations of minerals like calcium and phosphorus that can be used uh, selectively throughout the growing season to help plants with specific growing cycles. These mineral amendments are shelf stable so they'll sit on the shelf for years and you're diluting them at concentrations of one to 500 to one to a thousand. So one quart of this mineral amendment really turns out to be about 125 gallons of very, very useful uh, garden or farm mineral amendments. Vinegar extractions. In order to make vinegar extracted eggshells, I save my eggshells in jars to cook them all at once rather than cook them individually. This jar is a jar of uh, toasted eggshells ready to make extractions. Roasting eggshells with a toaster oven is really simple. Spread the eggs out. this set on light toast and there's a one time through the light toast setting. We'll give this another go. Here they are after a second go. And you can think things have turned colors. Um, 
I'm going to give this one more time. Give it a third toast on light. Uh, again, uh, experimenting with settings and uh, number of iterations. Third iteration. And after three goes, well, those are looking pretty good. Got that discoloration going. The organic matter is crunchy. And we'll give it a fourth iteration just to show what that does. Um, normally I would I would call this done, but we can go a fourth time. So this is a fourth iteration light toast. And we'll take a look at this. Those are good. Those are done. So in this case, I'd say those are a little overdone, but that's not going to hurt us. Um, so three light toasts was an optimal way to go. Uh, these can be now stored in a jar. We'll just throw them in here. And these are ready to be used to make apple cider vinegar extractions. Eggshells can also be cooked in a skillet simply by putting the eggshells in the skillet and roasting them with that sort of action until they also become discolored. Bones and oyster shells I often cook on a grill. I usually cook at about 350 degrees for 40 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe even 50 minutes depending. Uh, oyster shells a little bit less than bones. These bones have been on the grill at 350 degrees for 40 minutes. And they, I flip them uh, to try and be consistent. But uh, these are ready to be used for making a vinegar extraction of bones. These happen to be cow bones. This three liter can can be used to cook bones and shells as well by putting holes in the can um, and opening up the top. Bones can be put in there or oyster shells and then they can be left on an open flame in the fire pit overnight um, and retrieved in the morning. I have a variety of cooked items on my shelf. As they become available, I'll cook them and put them in jars. In this case, there's some bones from cows, pigs, eggshells, and oyster shells, um, all ready for vinegar extraction. The vinegar extraction process takes about a week or two weeks at the most, and uh, this allows me to have materials on hand um, in case I run out throughout the growing season. To actually make the vinegar extraction, put the eggshells into a jar, crushing them up just a little bit to increase surface area. Don't crush them too much. And you want to fill the jar about 10% of the volume with the eggshells. Something like that. And then add organic apple cider vinegar. You want to leave some space at the top for the reaction to have space to occur on. This is going to bubble up and you don't want it to go over the top. And then, of course, most importantly is to label the jar so that when you come back and look at it, sometime later you'll understand what was in it. Now 
let's watch this reaction. You can already start to see the bubbles forming in there. What is that? Getting your extracted eggshells. And we'll store that on a plate with a light cover so the gases can escape and if anything does froth over the top it'll land on the plate and not make a mess. We'll store this in the corner of the kitchen or any other stable place out of sunlight. After about a week or two um, the reaction will stop and it can be decanted and then more vinegar added for a second extraction. You can see that the eggshell has responded very quickly to the apple cider vinegar and popped the top and uh, left quite the foam on the top. That's why you keep it on a plate. Decanting is very simple. Um, in this case, I had two eggshell vinegar extractions on my shelf that had been sitting around for some time. Uh, this has a, uh, an initial September, 11, September 14th, 2020, and then a second extraction, October 10th, 2020. This was started in October 2013. Second one was August 2019. And then the third was July of 2020. So I'm going to put all of these into one container because it's kind of a mix mash. And I've labeled it eggshell vinegar extraction, multiple sources, December 31st, 2020. And you can see this is very easy to do. Use a, a funnel of sorts and a sieve. And I'm simply going to pour the liquid through. And the residual material I could put under a perennial plant or on the compost pile. Looks like this is pretty full. I'll just add a little bit more to top it off. And I have a quart of shelf-stable vinegar extracted eggshell for use in the garden. Decanting is done with a funnel and a sieve. Funnel just to hold the sieve, support the sieve, and make it easier to pour. Vinegar extractions are an extremely useful garden farming tool. Um, it allows closing of the waste gaps using oyster shells from a restaurant that would have been thrown away. Uh, the bones after making bone broth that would have been thrown out or thrown on the compost pile, uh, eggshells that might have been thrown away, and this one quart of vinegar extraction is not only shelf stable but also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is diluted at ratios one to five hundred or one to a thousand, making over a uh, hundred and twenty-five gallons of mineral amendment. Um, Examples of the composition of the vinegar extractions can be found in the appendix of my book, uh, and that actually shows the broad distribution of minerals that are in these uh, products, minerals like selenium and cobalt and uh, manganese and molybdenum uh, that might be difficult to source. Uh, quickly, it's realized that all of these minerals are had by these sorts of processes and it makes them uh, very important processes and makes the availability of these uh, otherwise um, not often thought of uh, elements quite uh, approachable for the backyard gardener or farmer. Okay, <clears throat> there we have that. All right. Got some questions? Okay. 
there are some uh, comments like in the chat. Um, it's do the bones, eggs increase the pH so the vinegar is okay for plants. And someone mentioned if it's super diluted with water now before use, I don't think the vinegar will be a problem. Correct. Yeah, the pH of uh, the vinegar is what, like four or five or something like that. And so when you're diluting it 500,000 to one, that's, that's going to take care of any acidity problem. That's correct. Okay, and uh, Amy has a question. Yeah, um, what's the purpose for cooking the bones and the eggs? Great. Uh, so there's two purposes. One, you want to get rid of all the organic material that's uh, hanging around the egg. Same with like uh, oyster shells and bones. Uh, so the bones in our house, uh, uh, Joan will buy a knuckle or something like that. And uh, first we'll eat the stew with the bones. Then we'll make bone broth out of the bones. And then after a couple of bone broths, then I get them. And there's still some organic material there. So you want to cook it and get rid of all that organic material. The other thing uh, the cooking does is it gets all the moisture out of the bone or the shell or whatever it is, and that allows the vinegar to penetrate those interstitial spaces within the whatever medium you're extracting. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie. So <clears throat> mine is more of a comment. I've done something similar for my for me. Um, usually, I use a lot of dandelions and maybe some red clover. And a little, a few, one or two eggshells, and then I do the vinegar thing, and then I just put the vinegar on salad or stir it into a juice or whatever. Um, I never thought of putting it on the garden, so thank you. But I've also never cooked the eggshell, but when I was doing it either. So yeah, but for what you're doing, you're you're eating it directly. You don't care if there's biology in there. If you put it on the right. shelf, the you know the biology might have a tendency to grow, for instance. So yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, this is you, you. It's a great comment, Stephanie, because it gives you another example of the plant is it's the same as us, right? You, how would how do we get plants nutrition? Well, Stephanie does it the same way she gives herself nutrition, for instance. So these whole plant models of the digestive system and foliar spraying through the skin and 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 nutrition for us all, uh, right? We're we're all in the same gig here. Right. Yeah. And I do recommend it for those who want to try it for yourself. It's, it's very high in minerals. We need them too. A lot of calcium in, in, in available forms. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl has a question. Um, just wanted to ask, what is the difference between the vinegar and the fermentation in what it brings of benefit to plants? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, uh, um, so being the engineer that I used to be, I had the same sort of questions. So I went and did something really silly. I went and started analyzing this stuff. And um, I'm gonna show you some of that analysis in just a minute. Um, and, um, and I've started a database to try and make this stuff available to everybody and, and offer you the opportunity to an analyze your own uh, um, products. Uh, the short answer is that when you ferment plant-based stuff, you get more of a distribution of plant-based minerals associated with that plant. When we start leaching with uh, uh, weak acids like vinegar, we get higher concentrations of certain minerals. And so the, that balance of the minerals is a little bit different. Um, we can also uh, do multiple uh, extractions with the vineral, vinegar and, and get different concentrations of things out, which is a really fascinating conversation as well. Um, so the easy answer is there are two forms of extraction and they have different characteristics associated with them. Okay, Amy. Yeah, um, I might have missed the part. Did you say you dilute those vinegar concentrated with some water? Yes. At what's the ratio? It's the same ratio, 1,000 to 1, 500 to 1, and I haven't talked about it, but uh, Pandora's going to. Uh, rainwater is the quintessential water to use uh, for many reasons, but mostly because it's condensed right up there and it comes right down here, and it has low concentrations of carbonates, bicarbonates, and sulfates in it. And so this greatly increases the effectivity of the foliar sprays that you're using. So rainwater is by default uh, uh, the water, the quintessential water to use if you have that ability. And Pandora is going to talk about that in a bit. Thank you. 
Uh, Cheryl, did you have another question? I do. Okay. Um, thank you. So you earlier were talking about the uh, different needs of plant minerals at different stages of a plant's growth. Can you, does that apply to these recipes, uh, yeah. these recipes and when would you use either one for optimal plant growth? I'm gonna answer your question in just a minute if you would allow, me. I'll, I'll do that in the presentation. And if I don't answer your question to your satisfaction, please ask another question. Okay. Uh, Nigel, yeah, I have a question. Of course. Um, so the apple cider vinegar, can that be made out of like, you know, the apples that like fall in the orchard or like you see a lot of apples, even in the neighborhood, like on the sidewalks, does it matter if they're rotten? So uh, that's a great question. And in fact, one of the recipes in my book is how to make bad wine, uh, AK apple cider vinegar. Right. I mean, the, the um, it's real. It's a so the easy answer is yes, Pandora, you can make it out of apples. Um, I have conversations, uh, one conversation with a person in Pakistan, and uh, we were talking about, you know, what to do and how to do it. And then his comment to me was, well, Nigel, we don't have apples around here and, and it's very difficult to find apple cider vinegar. And my comment to him was, well, look, you're a fruit grower. You've got a lot of fruit and, and vinegar is nothing more than wine gone bad so you can make your own vinegar out of the different fruits that you have available to you and this is one of the fantastic parts about having conversations with people around the world is is you recognize uh, what difficulties and what solutions they have in their backyard and how they can do that uh, in fact one of the recipes in my book is how to make apple cider and it's really simple to do you grab apples you do not want rotten apples you can use uh, in insect infected apples or or bad apples, I'll say, gnarly apples, but you do not want to use the rotten apple part. Um, and it's very simple. You cut them up, throw them in a crock, um, add rainwater, and this is the best part. Do nothing, just keep it covered and a mother will form. And after a few months, you'll have apple cider vinegar. So that's another way to close the waste gaps and to become more sustainable. Um, in your regenerative processes. You don't have to buy anything. You can use the apples that fall off a tree in your backyard or in the field or wherever. And the ones far away are usually better because they have a less probability of being sprayed with something nasty. Okay, nice. Um, I see a couple more questions, Cecilia. I spoke earlier about the vineyard um, once the grapes are crushed, some of those make it through the grape crusher and that are left behind. Can we use those grapes and or what about the grapes when we pull them out and we've already siphoned off the, the wine after it's fermented? Is that, can, can it be used to make vinegar? Um, so I haven't used that to make vinegar, vinegar but I don't see why you couldn't. But uh, I have a, a, a vineyard friend and um, he takes, he gives me, is it called the mark? The, the, the stuff that's left after crushing? And it's I the use, must. It's pardon the must. me? It's called must. The must, thank you. Yeah. The mark is previous in the process, that's right. Anyway, um, I make fermented plant juice um, out of the must and then I feed that to my grapes. So okay. there's another okay. thing you can do with, with uh, some of that. You may even be able to use vinegar to extract um, things from the must as well. And um, in these cases, I highly recommend that you do a mineral analysis of those products so you know what's in them. Uh, once you do the analysis a couple times, then you get some consistency and you'll know what minerals are in them and what concentrations, and then you'll have a better understanding of how to feed them back to your grapes um, later in the season. Um, if uh, um, I, I, in, on my website, I have a, a way in, uh, that you can actually uh, do the analysis of your uh, different products, your vinegar, or fermented plant juice extractions. And if you have any questions or are interested in doing that, you can contact me directly. Thank you, Nigel. I see a question in the chat. Uh, what about well water to dilute? Yeah, so um, I, 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 water is a, like another, right? Uh, well water comes in all different flavors as well. Uh, test the hardness of your well water. 
If you have a hardness that's less than like 75, then I would use that well water without blinking and I would feel blessed that I had the opportunity to have such a great source. Um, water that's harder than that um, essentially has those carbonates, bicarbonates and sulfates in them, which will reduce the efficacy of foliar sprays. So well water might be good, but have it tested so you know where you're at relative to hardness. Okay, Cheryl, did you have a question? Yes. Um, can you speak on the use of bananas or banana peels? So after eating them, instead of throwing them out, like um, I go to Costa Rica a lot and they make a vinegar out of banana peels, very similar to how you were talking about doing the apple cider. Yep. And so just, you know, wondering about bananas. Yeah. So the easy answer is why not? And uh, there's a perfect example of something that I'd go do and then I do an analysis on it to find out what's in it. And uh, the analysis that I'm talking about, you're talking $35 and, and you can figure out the mineral content. The problem with bananas for me is that the uh, processes of growing and uh, processing bananas uh, involves uh, minerals, all those size that we were talking about earlier. And so I would be very reluctant to make a product out of them because those are gonna get into my foliar sprays as well. Um, even if it was organic, uh, that might reduce the probability of some of the nasty chemicals getting in there, but it certainly doesn't guarantee it. Um, so um, I like to say when it comes to manures and other products that uh, go on my garden, I like to uh, interview the cows that, uh, before I use their manure. So this stands true for your bananas as well. I think that is all the questions there. But, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. But sorry. could you just repeat this? What about you said about the well water? You test it for hardness and you want what again? You want a value below 75. Okay, when, thank you. When you're testing water for hardness, you're essentially testing for carbonates, bicarbonates, and, and, and things like that in the water. And a, a, what you want is a minimal amount of those. That's why rainwater is so good. If you measure the electrical conductivity of rainwater, it's just about zero. And if you measure the electrical conductivity of other waters, you're going to find that it's charged. And uh, yeah, so. Thank you. Shall I keep going then? Um, I have another question. If I had a choice between well water and rainwater, what would you use? Well, if I had if I had never tested my well water, I'd use rainwater. Rain rainwater is my go-to. You can't beat it. It is the gold standard in water. Um, but if I had a well that had a really low uh, uh, hardness, you know, in the 50s or the 20s or something like that, I, I'd be blessed and and I'd use it. I'd use rainwater first, especially for foliar spraying. Okay, we're really looking for the efficacy of uh, of that foliar spray. And, um, and so I want to make sure I have as little uh, of those compounds in it as possible. And rainwater is going to give me that unless I had like super exceptional well water, which does exist. Okay. Well, I'll show you my water later in my presentation. Great. And you can let me know. <laughs> Great. Okay. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. I'll go back your screen. Okay, so um, there we are. And so now I'm going to talk about uh, mineral amendments. Um, and first at a very top level, uh, use glass or ceramics when you make these things. Uh, there are reactions going on, especially if you're using vinegar and uh, things like plastic are undesirable. Um, the bottom line is you use what you have. So uh, this is just a hierarchy of ideas. Uh, make them and store them well ventilated, constant temperature environments. The nice thing about here is we're really uh, taking care of waste gaps and we're not throwing anything away. We're, those bones, rather than going into the garbage, they're, they're being broken down even further. And, and, uh, and you can uh, use vinegar extraction several times. Uh, and then finally, they go on the compost pile. Um, we can use this at any scaling level. You don't have to use a five gallon bucket or a quart. You can use a 50 gallon bucket or something bigger. Um, always consider the life history of the materials. We talked a little bit about this in the banana question. But 
um, know where your uh, where your things are coming from. Uh, Grass-fed cows, for instance, uh, uh, would be desirable to CAFO. Uh, those CAFO cows are going to get antibiotics. They're fed GMO grains, uh, so their bones are going to have uh, a different content than a grass-fed cow from your friendly farmer down the street, for instance. Uh, different extractions have different mineral concentrations. We talked briefly about that, and and and. Uh, that's discussed also in, in uh, the book. Um, most important thing is to be thankful for the, the wonderful gifts that the earth provides. And I think this is a fundamental tenet of regenerative, sustainable gardening. Once we start thinking about how sustainable we want to be and, and how regenerative we need to be, um, we really need to be thankful for the amazing resources that we have available to us. So. I'm talking really quickly here. I, I, I realize that I've used up a lot of my time and I apologize for that. So I'm gonna try and move this through this fairly quickly. Um, you did see the videos and I think that helps out quite a bit, but these are very simple to make. Uh, I call it kiss, kitchen chemistry. Um, and it's very simple to make your own vinegar. Um, in fact, I argue to most people that you can actually make a vinegar extraction in the time it takes you to get into your car, go to that store to purchase something and come back. By the time you've spent the gas and the time and the resources to go and get that product, you could have made your own fermented plant juice or vinegar extraction. Um, I think that one of the most amazing things here is the ability for us to close our waste gaps. Um, I think uh, becoming friendly with uh, the restaurant you go to or the fish mar or meat market to uh, take waste away rather than having it thrown away is uh, extremely important. Um, there's a lot of resources around you, you just haven't figured them out yet. And so um, it's really important to do that and to try and close waste gaps and, and to become regenerative and sustainable in the way we do things. We talked about the dilution rates and having a very little bit go a long way. Um, and we've talked about the, we haven't talked about the non-toxic effects of the ecosystem. When I'm applying these foliar sprays or drenching with these products, there's no runoff that's going to destroy things. There's no extra things that hasn't, that comes out of solution or is going to uh, uh, get into our waterways um, or, or our wells and, uh, and cause any problems. So these are really self-reliant, empowering ideas and strategies that you need to think about. So this is the most important slide in, in, in this whole idea of mineral amendments. And I started off by talking about all these minerals that were needed in the, in the small proportions and, and how do I possibly get them into uh, the scales of parts per million that I need to put onto my garden. And so I have, uh, what I've done here is I've shown you some of the analysis that I've done on a stinging nettle fermentation, uh, fermented plant juice at the top row and the vinegar extracted egg, uh, bones at the, in the lower row. And at the top, these are all the minerals that uh, um, are being evaluated. And I'll go through them as chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, boron, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, aluminum, cobalt, molybdenum, silicon, selenium, and nickel. And you can see that um, all of these things are accounted for. Um, in these products that I made in my kitchen. Um, and uh, um, somebody asked about um, the difference between the fermented plant juice and the vinegar extractions. Well, if I look at the uh, phosphorus and calcium content of the vinegar extracted bones, I can see huge amounts relative to the plant juice. And, and this is what makes these valuable for taking care of the different uh, 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 points of influence, I call them. Uh, so when your plant is growing, we already talked about the fact that it needs different minerals at different phases of its life. And during flowering, your plant wants phosphorus. It wants a lot of phosphorus, a lot more than it does during the other phases of its life. And so where do you get phosphorus? Well, all of a sudden we see here that we have a source of phosphorus that we have on our shelf that we made simply by extracting uh, minerals from cow bones. And so we can now foliar spray that plant um, during the flowering phase with vinegar extracted eggshell, uh, uh, cow bones, for instance, in order to get that high phosphorus content. And in fact, I've uh, had instances where um, I've had uh, cucumbers that, that they, just, they just wouldn't flower. They're just sitting there and I can see 
the, the, the male or the female parts of the flower trying to flower, but the flowers never take. And merely by providing vinegar extracted uh, uh, cow bones as a foliar spray, I'm able to provide that plant with the phosphorus it needs and boom, all of a sudden I've got lots of fruit. The same with calcium. A lot of plants when they're uh, in the fruiting phase, like tomatoes that get black end rot, for instance, um, and, and other calcium deficiencies, or they, it may be calcium deficiencies. There could be some water problems going on there as well. Um, but that's another story. But anyway, so now all of a sudden I have the ability to provide a, a high calcium product, whether it's uh, vinegar extracted eggshells, vinegar extracted oyster shells. And you can see here, even the calcium level of the vinegar extracted bone shells is very high. And so now I have a way to provide those uh, concentrations of calcium to my plants during those specific phases of the plant. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any more questions. But suffice to say, uh, I think it was Cheryl, you were asking those questions. Uh, and here's an opportunity for you to now start dialing in how to feed your plants using something that you made at home for just about no money, free if you happen to make your own organic apple cider vinegar. And um, we can do this in an urban environment or in any other environment. So these, I think, are answering some of the questions that you had when you started the conversation. Okay. Okay, so maybe in the interest of time, Pandora, I ought to just keep going, or would you like me to just stop altogether, or what would you like? Um, what, what, what do you have left that you were gonna cover? I want to talk about measuring plants uh, using a refractometer, and I think that I can do that in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, go ahead and do that. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for that, Pandora, and I apologize for my um, poor use of time. Okay, share screen, go back to here. Okay. So this is the, a refractometer, um, and you can see using a squeezelator to drop a, a, a piece of juice on the refractometer. Um, I'm, I'm making use of the refractive index or the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum in a, in a particular medium. For those of you that used to try and catch fish in, in ponds when you were young, um, you'd grab where you think the fish was, but it really wasn't there. And that's because of the bending of light as it transverses through the air and the glass. Um, in short, the, uh, the idea of measuring percent sucrose, which is equal to one bricks, was established in the wine industry back in the 1800s. It's now used in many, many different industries. Essentially, what it's doing is measuring the percent sucrose in the plant sap. It's measuring uh, um, uh, sugar. And, and, and this has been calibrated to be in a scale of bricks. Um, and the reason for using a refractometer are many. Um, I like to use it to compare uh, the different farms or stores or gardens that I purchase things from. Um, I can use it to compare organic versus GMO. You might find some surprising results there. I think it's really important to measure plants in real time in the field by measuring the sac, uh, the percentage of sap in their leaf during the growing season. You can also use it to monitor crop, uh, crop health. Um, you can use it to measure the efficacy of your foliar spray or drenches, um, monitor your practices year after year, um, use it to measure the fruit that, that you want to save seeds from. If I have two tomatoes and one has a, a refractive index of seven and the other end has a refractive index of four, it's that one that has a refractive index of seven that I'm going to save the seeds from. You can also use it to calibrate your palate. Um, clearly, you know if something tastes better or not, but you can actually put a number to that. And on the right-hand side is what you see when you look through a refractometer. You're seeing a graduation from white to blue uh, or white to purple in some cases. And it's this transition area that is the actual refractive index. And in some cases, there's a blurriness that occurs, which is very desirable. That's an indication of some other uh, large complex molecules uh, um, that are affecting the refractive index. One of the things that's really cool about uh, the refraction or the percent sucrose is that insects recognize this. We've already talked about the fact that um, uh, uh, insects won't bother uh, plants that have a high sap 
sugar sap content. And when you get your refractive index of plants above 12, uh, you're going to find insect pressure all but disappears. And you're also going to find that as the refractive index goes through a scale of like you know, 7 to 12, you're going to see that the insects that are actually attacking your vegetables are going to change as well, which is just fascinating to me. Um, and then finally, um, bees won't go near um, plants that have a refractive index less than six. They know that the quality of that sugar, that sap, that pollen, that nectar is not worth checking out. And so they don't even go there. And I'm always amazed when I'm in uh, uh, nurseries where uh, huge numbers of hanging plants with these beautiful flowers are, are hanging all over the place and you walk around there and there's no pollinators there. Well, what's that telling you about the quality of the plant? And there's a scale for measuring refractive index. Um, and this is put together by Carrie Reams back in the, uh, um, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s timeframe. And you can see that there, you can actually determine the refractive index of many of the fruits and vegetables that you consume. Um, I like to talk tomatoes. If you look at the tomatoes here, you can see that a poor tomato has a refractive index of four and an excellent tomato has a refractive index of 12. Well, when we talk about uh, um, uh, refractive indexes of uh, tomatoes, when we talk about real tomatoes, uh, beefy, beef steak tomatoes, uh, tomatoes that are gonna be used in, um, uh, on a sandwich, for instance, um, my guess is nobody here has tasted a tomato that's better than uh, five. And uh, most of the tomatoes that you buy in the store are in the threes and the four range. Even the farm tomatoes these days are uh, best one you're going to find might be a five. Okay, so I have a, a, a video um, that shows how to use a refractometer. And uh, in the interest of time, I, I, I won't show that unless you really want me to. Um, you, um, what do you I'd do? love to see it. Okay. So, yes, please. Uh, is that okay with you, Pandora? Yeah, it looks like it's a popular idea. Okay, so uh, let me, this one's about maybe 12 minutes long and, and that'll wrap uh, up the, this portion. Okay. So how do I do this? I think I gotta do this first. Here we go. Okay, so now I'm sharing my screen. Okay, can you see my screen then? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Hello, my name is Nigel Palmer and I'm the author of the book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Garden Amendments. I'm going to speak a little bit about using a refractometer to measure the quality of the produce that comes into your house or measuring the health of your plant throughout the growing season year after year. This is a refractometer. It's a relatively simple device. No batteries, no moving parts. There are some things that you might want to look for when purchasing it. First is the scale. The scale that you see when you look into the device, the device wants to be around zero to 30 bricks. This is the range for most of the saps that uh, you'll be measuring. The temperature of the sap will make a difference as to its reading using this device. So getting a device that has temperature compensation already built into it is a good idea. The other device you may want to consider is a squeezelator. This is a modified vice grip. It's very useful when measuring the refractive index of leaves, uh, greens, um, and other larger things that uh, are more difficult to squish. It is listed as a modified vice grip and is available for about $45 at pikeagra-labsupplies.com. The refractive index is a measure of the percent sucrose in that sap, and it's calibrated in terms of bricks. One bricks equals 1% 1 sucrose. The refractive index of crop juice is listed in my book on page 190, Appendix F listing the refractive index of fruits, vegetables, and grasses as well. This is where I hope to have stains and edges that are beat up on your copy.
All right, so let's measure the refractive index of some fruits and vegetables. I selected uh, an orange, lettuce, and potato in order to provide the variation in um, uh, techniques for measuring the refractive index. And you'll see quickly why the squeezolator uh, becomes such an important tool. So let's start with the potato. So the first thing I want to do is grab a hunk of potato. And in this case, uh, we're using a beautiful magic molecule. And a smaller piece still. And now I will put that in the squeezolator and get my refractometer ready. And I'll give the potato a squeeze. I'm trying to get, you can see I'm squeezing that pretty hard. And I'm looking for that drop of sap. Here it comes. There it is, nice. I have my sap. I'll put the top on. And then I want to tap it. I want to make sure that there's no air in there. So that's nicely colored. And then I'll take a look through here. You want to look at this under light. It's nice to use sunlight. That's oh, got a nice big spread. So I'm going to call that 6.0. Plus or minus 0 0.5. 6.0 plus or minus 0 0.5. When looking through the refractometer, this is an example of what it might look like. This is not the actual reading, but something close to it. Once you've measured the refractive index uh, and recorded the value, you can look up on the uh, chart what you actually got. So for potatoes, poor is a refractive index of 3, and excellent is a refractive index of 8. And so we got a 6. So that's right in the middle of the scale, poor, average, good, and excellent for the potato. The other thing you can do is actually taste the sap. So we measured this at uh, 6, and so if I taste it, it's, hmm, okay. So now you're beginning to calibrate your palate to the values you see on the refractive index. And over time, you'll be able to recognize the flavor of a particular piece of produce and understand its quality by uh, calibrating yourself. So now I have washed the, um, the refractometer and the squeezolator. So the next thing we'll try is uh, to measure some lettuce. And um, you'll see that greens are a little bit more difficult than the potato to get juice out of. So first we'll put it in the squeezolator and we'll begin to squeeze. And you want to squeeze with everything pointing down. So as you squeeze, gravity has a tendency to move the sap uh, to the outlet where you want it. So there's our first squeeze and you can see nothing really happened. Right? So we'll wait a few minutes and then what I'm going to do is loosen it. and then tighten it up a little bit, maybe an eighth of a turn, and then give it another squeeze. Wait, nothing. So I'll tighten it, another eighth of a turn, and then squeeze again. You can see the sap is beginning to come out now. So I'll get my refractometer ready to accept the sap. Eighth of a turn, squeeze. And sometimes this takes many, many iterations and you have to actually um, re-ball up the, the leaf in the refractometer to get a better squeeze. I'll demonstrate that. It's just by putting everything back in a little bunch in the middle and then squeezing again. And you can see that that did a lot. You see there's quite a bit of sap there at the bottom now. So that's probably enough, a couple drops. So we'll put that on the refractometer. Put the top over, tap it to make sure all the air bubbles are out, and then we'll go over to the sunlight and make a measurement. Four plus or minus point 0.1. Four point zero plus or minus point 0.1. A much narrower band, and if I look at the lettuce on the chart, uh, four is poor. 6 is average, 8 is good, and 10 is excellent. So this lettuce comes up as a 4, and it's got a very narrow band. So this is not 
a really great uh, uh, example of a lettuce. And of course I could taste it. Okay, tastes okay. So I'm going to go and wash these things now. Okay, and then finally we'll do an orange. This is a an organic orange. Um, and we'll see that citrus are very easy. Uh, just a matter of making a cut and then giving a squeeze. No squeezelator required here. Very easy to get the juice from citrus. And we'll tap that. Nice plenty of sap. And we'll give that a reading. And this came out to be 10 point 10.6 plus or minus 0.2 and then I'll taste that to calibrate my palate mm. Mm, tastes pretty good to me citrus is so nice this time of year and we'll look at our chart and we see for orange poor is uh, 6 average is 10 good is 16 and excellent is 20 so we're in the 10 so this is an average orange but um, geez, I wonder what a 20 might taste like. Here's another example of what it looks like when you look through the refractometer when taking a measurement. Note the blurriness of the line between the white and the blue sections. This would be a reading of 10.5 plus or minus 0.3. Here's one final example of a Brix reading, 20.4 plus or minus 0.2. Record keeping is very useful. Over the course of many years, uh, you'll be able to see the change in quality of the produce, produce that you grow and uh, maybe even the produce you purchase. I like to use the refractive index for not only measuring the produce that comes into my house and monitoring the um, refractive index of the things I grow year after year, but also to monitor the health of the plant throughout the day. By measuring the refractive index every couple of hours of the leaf of the same plant during the day, you can actually watch the rise and fall of the refractive index, specifically on a bright sunny day. As photosynthesis kicks in, the sugar content of the sap of a plant increases, and you can actually measure this as time goes on. If the refractive index of the plant does not change throughout the day and stays flat rather than going up and down, that's an indication of a boron deficiency of your plant. Another use for the refractometer is to measure the efficacy of the foliar sprays that you apply. When you apply a foliar spray to a plant, it should have a rather quick response on the order of minutes or hours. And the refractive index of the sap within the leaf should increase. Measure the refractive index in the two plots, say three or four different plant leaves, the third leaf from the top of the plant or the first full leaf, pick a nomenclature that suits you, and measure three different plants with that in mind. Do that on the plot you're going to apply the foliar spray and the plot you're not going to apply the foliar spray. Once you have those readings, then apply the foliar spray to one of those plots. Wait an hour or two, and then measure the refractive index of those plants in the same manner, using the same nomenclature, to determine if there was an increase or not in those plant sap readings. If you don't get a positive response, wait until the next day and try again. It could be some time before the plant decides it likes or needs that foliar spray. If you get a negative response, then that's a good indication that the plant did not appreciate what you were applying to it. This is very useful going forward to evaluating the efficacy of homemade mineral and biological amendments. So there's a summary of the use of the refractometer. Try it and gain some information about the quality of the fruits and vegetables that are coming into your house. Once you realize that the fruits and vegetables that are coming into your house are of 
some low value, now you have the ability to have a conversation with your grocer about the quality of the food you're purchasing in the store. This is very important. This is very empowering to have this conversation. These conversations are very important for all of us. As more of us bring this conversation to our grocers, the more awareness about the quality of the foods we eat will occur. Okay. I have one final slide, and this is a summary slide of what I talked about. Um, first of all, the rhizosphere is the plant's digestive system, and the soil breaks down minerals into compounds that plants can use, just like our digestive system. The plants selectively feed that soil ecosystem. This is just a fantastic idea that, that this symbiotic relationship between plants and the rhizosphere. Insects cannot eat healthy plants. They don't have the enzymes in their gut to digest those sugars. You can make your own mineral amendments that are broad spectrum, informed plant can use sustainably for free or low cost. And in doing so, you can close the waste gaps around you. Foliar sprays provide plants they need in forms that they can use. Um, and this can help when you're growing plants in situations where the soil might not be as best it can be. And finally, you can measure plant health using a refractometer. All right, that's what I have today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Nigel, I have a couple of questions in the chat. Sure. Uh, one is, can you share any websites, uh, best researches for the refractometers? And also, can you please repeat the info for the squeezolator? Ah. Uh, yes, let me try. So as far as refractometers go, uh, you're going to go online and go refractometer and all kinds of stuff's going to come up. And you're going to find some of these things for hundreds of dollars. And you're going to find them for um, $30, $40. Um, I recommend the $30, $40 one. The two things that you want to look for in purchasing a refractometer is one, um, look for something that has temperature compensation in it. Uh, that will eliminate some of the sources of variation. Sources of variation are the boon of science. Uh, you may or may not realize that. So and, and the refractometer is a, uh, is a device that has a lot of variation in it for a whole bunch of reasons. So getting compensation, temperature compensation will help with that. What was the other thing? Oh yeah, a scale. Um, the refractometer scale wants to be like from zero to 35. Let me just check what this one is. Yeah, zero to 30, zero to 35. Um, and that'll take care of most of the things that you're going to be interested in. Uh, the exception is garlic. Uh, garlic uh, has a refractive index of on the order of like 40 or 50. No wonder it tastes so good. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, if you want to measure something like that, you'll need a higher scale. But so the long and short is go cheap, uh, scale of up to 30, 35, and tem temperature compensation. Oh, and the squeeze later. Um, pikeagsupplies.com, and that might not be exactly it, but uh, uh, pikeagsupplies.com uh, is, is, is a good shot, and, and maybe if somebody's hip and stuff, you can do that while we're talking and, and come up with the real address. Okay, it looks like Narana has a question for you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for a great presentation. It was really informative. I just wanted to ask in regards to uh, the impact of this amendment on this plant, like as you mentioned in the beginning, how plants would extract nutrients and everything they need from the soil and uh, they have a relationship with fungi. I wonder like, if those amendments um, impact them in a way that they become dependent on, on those amendments. And have you noticed that uh, pre, like future years, does it impact? Like, do you have to put more or less of those amendments? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, it's one that I uh, address. Um, um, so let's talk about it like this. Let's talk about nitrogen, for instance. Well, um, the we all know that uh, nitrogen in the air is in the form of N2. It's inert and it requires uh, um, fixing, that we call it, in order to become available to plants. And that requires uh, nitrogen fixing, bacteria, fungi, archaea, whatever it might be. And so if we're in a situation uh, where a lot of people put nitrogen on their soil, like in the beginning of the growing season, that plant is thinking, cool, man, I've got all the nitrogen I need. There's no reason for me to use my plant exudates to feed nitrogen fixing uh, biology in the soil because I'm getting all the nitrogen that I need. Then all of a sudden that person doesn't put nitrogen on the soil for whatever reason. Maybe they think that all I got to do it is once at the beginning of the season. All of a sudden that plant is in a bad shape because it no longer has formed those symbiotic relationships with the nitrogen fixing biology and its nitrogen supply is going to become less than optimal and it will suffer. A lot of uh, chemically treated lawns, all of a sudden you'll see they're nice and lush and green, and then all of a sudden they're yellow, for instance. That, that might be an example of that sort of scenario. The same is true with nutrition. So if I'm in, a, in a, an environment where my soil is very poor and does not have the nutrition in forms that plants can use, those plants will suffer and be of low quality and perhaps die. And so I have a choice now between either providing them with those nutrients that they need in the form of foliar sprays and the minerals that we just talked about or not. And so the reason that it's important to find, to provide them those minerals is once I get that healthy plant, remember now that the healthy plant is gonna actually feed sugars to the soil biology. And so by feeding the, so the plant those nutrients, I'm actually feeding the soil biology as well. And so I am, in a way, I am helping that soil in the long term and the biology in the soil in the long run by virtue of the fact that I'm giving the plant the nutrients it needs to feed the soil. There is a dependency going on, but because we're working in a situation where our soils are so poor to begin with, we have little choice in the short term, but to provide those minerals to the plant, knowing that the soil will be fed as well. So what you say has some validity associated with it. And now I hope you have the tools with this soil plant model to rationalize why it's worth doing it or why it's worth not doing it in the short and the long run. Okay, thank you, Nigel. You're welcome. Um, so uh... I'm gonna be doing a short presentation, maybe like 20 minutes on um, uh, a rainwater catchment system. And uh, we will have time after that for more questions for me or Nigel or um, to choose you know, a topic discussion. So let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so here again is Nigel's information. If you want to find out about more of what he was uh, talking about. And some of my information so you can find me. So um, yeah, I'm gonna share a little bit about one particular property with a rainwater catchment system and swales and um, uh, give an overview of the pop property and show the purpose of the rainwater catchment, some components of the system, and then a little, maybe a little bit share about the future plans and then potential for other uses and then I'd be interested afterwards um, you know to find out maybe how you could use this you know on on your property. So this is the the property 
um, that uh, we're going to be looking at today. Uh, it's about uh, two, two acres. It does have um, uh, these two different buildings, two or three, depends on how you count it, but there's one big building in the back and then one small one in the front and then a little tiny house in the front. Uh, so you can see some of like the garden areas, there are shared garden areas, there's individual garden plots, um, like more like community plots. Uh, and then you see a driveway down the left hand side. Here's another view of the property. So you'll see like on the right hand side in the bottom, there's three houses. So this property actually cuts behind um, those three houses. So it's most of the field that goes back in there. Uh, this, I, I don't own the property. Um, I'm, I'm a renter here and I didn't design any of these systems. I just wanted to share with you the, the water system that I'm using for my gardener. And uh, let's see, well, I used to be um, paid to manage all the gardens, but uh, yeah, I'm retired from that and just working on my own garden now. Um, so yeah, um, uh, so for future reference um, in the presentation, uh, take a note of uh, the parking lot area, that one strip kind of down the middle. And if you look to the right of it and you see a circle, circular shaped garden with kind of pie shapes, that actually used to be also a parking lot. Um, so yeah, the, the, building, the building in the back, the big one, you can see some solar panels and you can see um, it's kind of a large roof. There's three different sections of the roof on two different buildings. Uh, that roof was not originally there. Um, the metal roof uh, was put on. I think I have a picture of the metal. Yeah, so the metal roof was put on so that we could attach the solar and for better rainwater collection. Uh, if you notice along the edges of the roof where the kind of the gutter area is, you'll see some black pipes running down there. So that's part of what is catching our, our water. Here's a section that is uh, going a step down from one building to the other. And then there's one connection to a downspout. That's the same downspout and it goes down um, to this garden area here. And then th the water comes out um, in this kind of hollowed out log, and then it goes, it begins to go down uh, what we call our swale system. And a lot of it is covered with this like pebbled rock. That's another view. Every now and then we have a little place where it could pool, um, kind of makes it kind of more decorative. This is uh, one of the walkways there, just a little ways down from what I showed you. And you can see how the water can run uh, through the cement block and go on its way through the rest of the rock swale. So this might be a little bit different, this part of the swale than, than what you've seen. Um, I think you've seen some maybe more industrial buildings that have kind of a rock swale. So it's kind of more, you can see uh, the water running down it. It, you know, it makes a, a nice visual. Um, and 
you know, when there's a downpour, sometimes all of us run out and look at the water running down. But it is, uh, I think, kind of set up this way to, as an example of showing, you know, where the water is running. And we do tend to have a lot of, um, you know, tours on the property to show people what's going on. And um, when I when I used to work on these gardens, these rocks would sink down into the mud. And um, I'd have to go and dig them all up again uh, and bring them back to the surface. So a lot of times you'll see in uh, rainwater catchment, you'll see kind of more some plants filling it up um, rather than rocks. And that's the reason why. Um, so uh, this is an IBC container. Some people use these for rain barrels. And we're not doing that. This is another liquid in here that it's part of our composting system. And then there, of course, in the center is a rain barrel uh, with a connection at the bottom. Uh, we're also not catching the water there. That's, uh, that's part of the composting system. Okay, here is a 1,500 uh, 1, gallon uh, water tank. And um, it, it is filled with water. Uh, and I think future plans are for it to catch some of the rainwater from the roof. Right now, it's not doing that. If you look on the left, there's a, a big like metal pipe and that pipe goes up and it kind of arches up and uh, around and then attaches to the roof. So, uh, you know, kind of, is an example for maybe what we could do in the future or what somebody could do is, you know, attach some kind of flexible line to that to catch their rainwater. On one side of the building, uh, we had trouble with leaves clogging up the system because um, parking lot side doesn't have any leaves, but on the other side, there are a lot of trees. So we developed this kind of filtering system. So that's just kind of your ordinary kitchen sink. And uh, you can see it goes down between like two different building levels. Uh, that's a close up of the same sink. You can see how there's a big mesh strainer. And uh, so you can strain out the leaves and then you do have to go in there and clean that out every now and then. And uh, that's, yeah, what happens if you start collecting sinks. <laughs> Here's another sink. Um, oh dear, how do I get rid of that? Okay. Uh, yeah, here's another kitchen sink. There's a faucet on it that's, uh, that's, I don't know, just for decoration, doesn't do anything. But this is another sink that um, is filtering the water. And then you'll see, uh, kind of a crisscross of black pipes. So we're, um, yeah, we're using that. Part of it goes down to what you call the first flush system. So when it first starts to rain, it kind of can flush some of the gook, like if you didn't have the filtering system for the leaves or still there might be some gook that gets through. So it'll flush it first and then before the water starts going in the swales. That's the bottom of the sink and how it's attached to the pipe. And that's underneath the sink. Um, it's a big crisscross of pipes so that part of that goes and runs along the front of the building and then eventually to the swale. And the other part is going down into the first flush system. So this is the outlet for the, the flush. Uh, you can see two different uh, levers 
on here so that uh, you can man manually control that. As another view of the same one. And then this is where um, it is coming off the front of the building. So there's kind of a beige pipe running along. We've just like, that's the same black pipe, but we have painted it the same color as the building. And then you can see the pipe uh, coming off. And that goes to the top up here. Uh, it's a close up of the top. So we've got different pipes going different directions. That's the bottom of this kind of archway support. And then we have um, rain chains and stained glass and whirly gigs. And you can see the little white outlet pipes on top of each rain chain. Uh, this again is uh, kind of, um, you know, just decorative and fun and kind of shows people where the rainwater is uh, being guided to. And here's one of the, it's like a bicycle wheel. And so it's, you know, it spins and makes noise when the rain goes down. So we also have um, an on and off switch, we can turn the water on and off. And um, I'll let you know how that works later on. Remind me if, you, if you're curious. Um, so that when people come for a tour, we can turn that lever on and actually have water coming through it uh, without rain coming down. Um, so yeah, under that arch, uh, this is the swale area there. You can see some nice um, water plants, some iris and um, different other plants. And that's the outlet going out with a kind of a pebble uh, rockway there and going down. And then under a walkway. This is another way for the water to go uh, through a walkway. So it just kind of percolates through between the, the big stones and you can still walk across there. Uh, that section I showed you then goes into this um, cement pond that we found on the property while digging. And there's some cattails in there. And then that's the outlet from the existing cement pond that's been there. Who knows how many years, maybe 100. And here we're going into a part of this whale system that has uh, a lot more plants in it. Um, you can see like some sedges and, and rushes and, and things like that that you would normally put in, in a swale type of system. And depending on what kind of plants you put, um, this could be fairly easy to maintain. Uh, and you'll see a lot of the rainwater catchments like along the streets of Portland, they'll have these types of plants in there. And uh, more water plants this is a rush plant there, the grassy type guy. And then at the end, uh, this is where it kind of transitions and there is, there's a red, red twig dogwood. And then the bottom end right now, 
uh, that's near the street is being redone. So it used to have a bunch of plants and now um, it is, I think it's gonna be a reflecting pond right now. And most of this, most of the swale, um, you know, goes dry, but every now and then the bottom part will fill up with water. And then it goes out uh, to the street. So this is kind of our overflow that goes out across the sidewalk and down into the street. Uh, one of our goals is to kind of catch all of the water on the property. So even across the driveway, we have these um, driveway grades. Uh, this is the bottom of one of the driveway grades. So the water goes into the swale system. And then overall, what we're actually doing is not keeping it in containers, but we're just letting the water percolate down into the aquifer um, so that we can pump it up and uh, and use it, you know, it, with our well. And so it comes out all of the irrigation with the spigots. This is the faucets we were using, but we're changing to this because it's just a quarter turn to turn it on and off. And they don't, the other ones are kind of wearing out. And um, yeah, the cat came to say hello as I was taking pictures. <laughs> we have one cat for 50 people, so she's a pampered cat. Yeah, so that um, that's the rainwater that I'm using. <laughs> I don't know if you'll, I mean, I guess under that archway, I could put a bucket and then collect the rainwater there. But other than that, um, I'm using, I guess, well water from the aquifer uh, and some of which that we collected. And I'm not sure you can call this actually rainwater um, catchment. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know another name. <laughs> if anybody else knows what to call that, uh, let me know. Yeah, so does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so <clears throat> if I understood correctly, you don't actually capture it in a cistern or anything. It just trickles through and you're using it as, as the plants absorb it as it goes down that, that swale. Is that right? Oh, uh, that's a good question. and. We're not, I mean, like in permaculture, if you study that, the swales are used for guiding the water into where the plants are um, so that you can kind of keep those areas moist. And that's not actually, um, that's not actually really what we're doing right here. What we're doing is just keeping the water from going out onto the street um, because in Portland we have the big pipe pro project and we get tons of, of rain here and it kind of floods our, our sewer system. And we figure, well, it's just, you know, why not pour that into our own aquifer where we can we can use it. But yeah, we don't. Uh, we currently don't have, you know, any rain barrels or, or buckets or anything like that where we're collecting it directly. Yeah, because I'm, I'm in the Portland area also. I haven't been here very long and I'm still trying to 
uh, get my head around stuff, but I was thinking it would be so useful to capture some water to use in the summer. So you guys don't do that, it sounds like, okay. No, and um, we did like most of the time because we're like refreshing our own aquifer, we haven't had problems with pumping up the water, but you know, when we had that drought this summer, uh, it seemed like it was running dry a couple of times because the water pressure was like a dribble. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, but most of the time- we have, a, we have a well here, but we haven't noticed that phenomenon yet. Oh, good, yeah. We're, I think we're at 75 feet here. So we're, we're thinking of, you know, we need to drill a little bit deeper. Hi, ah, anybody else have questions on, on that? There's some, there's a question in the chat and a comment in the chat. Oh, in the, in the... oh yeah. Um, yeah, I'm in Portland, Oregon. So this one person's in Denver where it rarely rains. Um, and yeah, maybe next time, uh, the next conference, I think I'm going to have uh, this one uh, professor that goes around to the drier area, parts of the world, and he does rainwater collection in those areas. And then you really do want to like collect and save everything you've got. Yeah. Yeah, it all depends on your part of the world. And um, and what you need to do there, definitely. Yeah, Cecilia, do you have a question? I do. I don't know if you have any answers because I too am from the Southwest and we're quite, quite dry here. So my question is, how do you keep from growing mold or algae in a, in a water catchment, number one? And number two, are you familiar with capturing gray water? Okay, yeah, those are some those are some good questions. So um, the tank we have, we haven't, I think they put like food grade peroxide when they filled it up, but that was several years ago. And I know a neighbor, so we haven't done anything with that water. Um, but a neighbor of ours, who has a big tank like that, he actually has to get in there and clean it out every couple of years. And he said there does get kind of a slime mold yes, in that's, there. That's, yeah, and that's yeah. not anything we want to go into our plants, just like we wouldn't want to drink that. So yeah, and so nothing on gray water then? Uh, gray water cap so, so gray water, um, we don't have a large gray water system like from the laundry room or anything, but we do have a small one with an outdoor sink and an outdoor shower. And so, that system, I actually have a video of it online when they installed it. And it currently goes into, I think our artichoke bed and then a kale bed. Uh, but we are using, you know, because uh, it's just a very small system, we're able to control what goes in there. So we have a certain soap that people use you know, right there, and they know they're only supposed to use that soap. Did that, that answer it? Um, no, I've got another question. I always have questions. No, go ahead. Um, <laughs> maybe for your next conference, you could get somebody, you know, if you're going to get somebody from, from the drier climates to help us with this kind of, of, I guess, problems that we have. If you could get somebody on capturing gray water, because that's one of my biggest complaints here in the Southwest is that everything just goes into the systems, into the septics and into the, to the sewages. And that's just water that we're in the process of doing some remodeling. And I already told my husband, I want one of my kitchen sinks to go right into a cistern of some sort that I will only rinse like vegetables and that kind of stuff and do the washing and the other. So if we could have something like that at the next conference, I'd really appreciate it. I think it would be quite useful to those of us that don't get the, the copious amounts of water that you get up in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, and I do have someone, that's the person I was talking about before. Perfect. And okay. they do not only catching water where there's like not hardly any, but they do gray water and all of that. 
and they Beautiful. wanted to participate today, but they were leaving the country to go and do that. So okay, um, they didn't. Well, yeah, they weren't able to to do that today. But yeah, I, I'll make sure that I get him for next time. I think it would have been an information overload anyway. So I think this was kind of a good thing that they weren't here because I know my mind is just swirling with all of this information. So thank you for that. It, it's a lot, yeah. Yeah, okay, Cheryl. Uh, yes, so someone mentioned uh, the rain catchment system and not wanting it to grow mold and bacteria. And I had read some research on, uh, you know, we were talking about the oyster shells, using oyster shells to purify water. And the next step, which uh, was mentioned as well, is to char the oyster shells and breaking them up before you put them in uh, whatever container to purify the water. So that's something that um, you know, should be looked into. Okay. Um, so sort of like you'd have the ceramic beads in like the fish ponds. The charring of the bone, would that be for like charcoal filtration? Uh, it's the oyster shells. Oyster shells. It, it okay. uh, purifies the water. Interesting. I hadn't heard about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I see a, a question in... Um, in the chat, do you filter or clean rainwater from the driveway to avoid chemical contamination? Yeah, I mean, that's a concern of mine. There are cars parked there and they're leaking oil and then you're guiding that water into, you know, our water system. And it's not a system, you know, that's really meant for drinking water or potable water. Um, the black pipes we use are not, uh, you know, certified potable. Um, so, you know, I think a few people might be drinking the water, but um, it, it's a it's a eco focused, um, you know, apartment com complex, and so their eventual goal is to get most of the driveway and most of the cars out of there. And so future plans would be um, to expand the solar and the roof I showed you, there's actually more solar panels on there than in those photos. Uh, the next phase is um, putting one of those clear solar collectors. So it's kind of like a greenhouse roof uh, across like, um, I think a third of the driveway there. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the plan is to be able to get rid of most of the cars out of the driveway. And if you look at the bottom of the driveway, we have EV charging stations down there. Um, so I think those, yeah, there might be a grate below that. I'm not sure, but I think we're gonna end up with two parking spots at the top and a loading zone for, you know, loading important things. And then just, uh, I think three or four EV charging stations. Whereas before we had like 32 cars were, um, they're in the process of, yeah, getting rid of most of the parking in the driveway. Um, yeah, Greg, uh, you had a question? Yeah, you, you showed a picture of a 1,500-gallon water storage tank, and then you showed the, uh, the flush, uh, et cetera, but you did mention, you said it was not, not used, the tank? Was that what uh, that No, we haven't, we haven't used it. Um, what we did was we filled that with the well water so the water that we collected in the aquifer, we pumped it back up and put it in the tank. And so that it's an emergency storage of, of water right now. It's not a water that we use on a daily basis. So it's uh, for, like for drinking water, in other words, I assume. Uh, yeah, if there were a big emergency. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh. <laughs> 
Cheryl, do you have a question? No, that was my, my hand was raised from the previous comment. Got it. That I made. Okay, I try to put the hands down when I remember, but I forgot. Um, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question actually about a comment that someone made in the chat. It said that um, catching is not really allowed, not in any quantity. Allowed by whom? So there's different uh, different states and different cities have you know different um, laws. Um, now I'm not sure state of Oregon actually. I'm not sure it's actually legal to catch water here, but the city of Portland doesn't want their sewers flooded, and so you know they actually want you to put in these permeable driveway surfaces and they're you know very supportive of us doing that. I know some places they're not going to be you know supportive of you doing that. I'm reading some of the chat. Okay. Um, okay, just some recommendations. Uh, Oh, Cheryl, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the issue of rain catchment. And I remember having read uh, an article, I think it was in Florida, where a man was actually arrested because it was illegal because he was catching rainwater off of his roof. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I would hope in the future we have the right to catch and drink water. Um, did somebody have a question? I think I accidentally put a hand down that wasn't, that I didn't cover, no? Okay, so Nigel has a question. Yeah, just to clarify, I believe the person that put that note up was from Colorado. And in Colorado, it is illegal to catch rainwater unless you have a, uh, a permit for a well, and that well permit allows you to use the water for purposes of agriculture. Um, and this is a new law. Uh, uh, I think that law came into effect sometime in the 2000 and maybe nine, I'm, I'm going on memory. Before that, it was just plain old illegal to capture rainwater in the state of Colorado. Um, so um, this is, it's not uncommon. Uh, there are many countries around the world where it is absolutely illegal to capture rainwater. Um, and there are places uh, in South America and um, where that's the case. Um, also, uh, rainwater is, um, if you look at companies like Pepsi and Coke, um, they have uh, adopted the uh, laws in many countries uh, where uh, it, it's their water and it's illegal for uh, participants or uh, residents to capture rainwater. So you don't have to look far to find amazingly restrictive laws on rainwater. Yeah. Uh, so Nigel, now that I've showed you where I get my water, <laughs> um, like, do you think, would you think there's enough, like, rainwater in the well water I'm using. I don't know if you can even answer this, but it's kind of a mix of whatever's flowing in that underground river and whatever we're collecting, I guess. Yeah. The as easy, far as like making those mineral extractions. The easy answer is I don't know, but um, you live in a very lush part of the world and it would be very easy to divert some portion of strictly rainwater to be used for the purposes of foliar spraying and other um, more definitive agricultural purposes. Yeah, I could just put my bucket under that arch when it when it rains. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, uh, one other comment somebody made about capturing rainwater and preventing algaes and things like that. Um, 
putting a cover on your rain collecting uh, medium device, whatever it is, is will go a long way to preventing airborne um, um, things getting into to your rainwater as well as insects. And uh, a lot of people have problems with insect larvae in their rainwater as a short-term issue. So having a cover for that is, is very helpful as well. Um, and larger animals like raccoons. Yep, and dead mice. Um, a, a lot of animals will um, seek out your rainwater because it will be one of the only sources of water around during a drought period. Um, and they'll jump in and get all the water they can drink and then they can't get out and they die. And that will uh, affect your rainwater if you don't monitor it um, with some regularity. Yeah, well, we're kind of running, the program's running a little bit longer as far as schedule wise. We have less than 45 minutes. So I'm thinking instead of like, picking a discussion topic, we could just do more Q&A or free for all discussion. How does that sound? Yeah? Yeah, sounds good. One, one vote of yes. <laughs> what do you think, Nigel? Uh, I'll support anything you like. Okay, there's a couple of thumbs up and a lot of no answers. <laughs> ah, yeah, so um, I'd say, yeah, just raise your hand if you want to ask a question of me or Nigel, or if you have something to share, um, you know, on one of these topics or another garden topic, you're welcome to share. I, I think there's few enough we can probably do it without the hands, but um, I just wanted to say, Nigel, thank you for the further info about the water legalities. I had no idea. That's mind blowing, actually. Yeah, especially in the land of the free, as it were reported to be called. <laughs> oh my, Elizabeth. Uh, yes, I want to. I just want to thank both of you um, for this interesting, um, for all the interesting information. I've learned a lot today, and I'm very happy that I connected. And I'm, I am in shock to learn that um, in some countries, water, you, it's illegal to get the rainwater. I, I always thought it was, it's, it's, it's everybody, you know, it's free. And so I will be doing a little bit more research because I am interested in learning more about, um, about this issue that which is. It's not okay at all. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Cheryl? Yes, I'm um, just wondering if you could speak on other uh, home products, items that are beneficial for soil health. I listed a few as you were talking and if you could speak to, on, speak to any of these. So um, like cinnamon, uh, diatomaceous earth, Epsom salts, um, worm castings. Yeah. I think that's for you, Nigel. Okay, uh, sure. So uh, again, uh, I think of the uh, regenerative and sustainability aspect of all of those products you just mentioned. Uh, let me see if I can remember them. Epsom salts, so that's uh, magnesium sulfate. Um, uh, sulfur is a really important compound in the soil. If you live in an area where there's a lot of rainwater or snow, uh, that's going to leach out. So sulfur compounds are really important. If you remember, we talked about the ratio of uh, uh, calcium and magnesium and other uh, minerals and calcium wanting to be at 68%. So um, one of the few products that I actually purchased, I actually buy this, is gypsum. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. And um, if you can get it directly from a mine, uh, when you buy it in the store, it's quote unquote time released or hydrated or some other thing. And it's essentially coated with something. Sometimes that coating is clay, uh, which probably won't hurt your soil. Sometimes it's something other than that. Uh, so finding a, a mine that you can get uh, gypsum from is very, very valuable. Gypsum is, is very, very useful in agricultural products and, and for, for many different reasons. Uh, that uh, I probably don't have time for right now. 
uh, Epsom salts you mentioned, diatomaceous earth. So diatomaceous earth is uh, um, uh, small shells that uh, um, have died um, many, many years ago and formed uh, um, um, areas in the sea and other parts of the world that they can be mined and dug up. Essentially, uh, it's small shells. They're very sharp um, and is a very uh, a useful source of silicon. Um, I suggest there are other places you can get silicon that are more local and perhaps more sustainable. Um, uh, basalt and granite quarries. Uh, we didn't talk about rock dust, but uh, I talk mm -hmm. a, a lot about rock dust and the ability to use locally sourced rock dusts uh, for the garden. Uh, when quarries crush rocks, the very fine powder is a waste product for them and um, they uh, will give it away for free. Um, it's well worthwhile using that geological survey information to find out uh, what quarries are in your local area um, and then go to those quarries. They often have already done the analysis on the rocks that they crush because they're responsible for knowing what's in them, especially if they're going to sell them. And mm -hmm. uh, they'll give you some of those assays for free, as well as the rock dust. Um, I don't know. What, was there another one you mentioned? Perhaps I missed something. Um, I was also asking about cinnamon. Um, so the work that I do is mostly in urban area. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And, you know, I try to present information that's very accessible to people so that it's like kind of a no brainer. And so like going in your kitchen cabinet and getting things that you use already personally for your cooking or, you know, health benefits to yourself that can also be used with plants yeah. is something that I find people can gravitate to and, you know, just kind of like tap into without feeling like what the heck is this person talking about? So, so eggshells and, and bones and are going to fall into that category rather nicely. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but I'm um, going to uh, announce on my website within the next week, a, a conversation, three conversations that I'm going to hold in uh, February and March, sorry, end of January and beginning of February, there'll be three conversations. One is doing all this stuff at the farm scale. One is doing stuff in the garden, but there's gonna be one specifically on, on urban aspects that might prove interesting to you. That'll be a, 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 a Zoom conversation that I'm offering for free. Um, and I might as well plug, I, I do offer a, a program, uh, a five part, two hour program that has seemed to be very successful and, and, and well received that I'll offer again, probably in the end of February, March timeframe that you'll be able to see on my website. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl, I think it's really, really important that these conversations in the urban environment take place because um, there are so many people in that environment that A, need the information so badly, um, but also the population density um, is, is such that um, providing ideas and solutions in that environment is, is just absolutely just so important. And, and sorry, I could go on about why that is, but I think most people recognize it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm also in an urban area. Um, I don't know if you can tell, there's a bunch of houses down the street this just happens to be like a little pocket that's left over in the middle of the city <laughs> so um beautiful too yeah it's it's pretty it's it's a little kind of haven in inside there so it's kind of different that i kind of almost have both Let's see i thought i saw some hands up but i don't see them now did I delete anybody's hand? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we might not, there's only 17 people left. We might not need to do hands. Does anybody have any other things they'd like to talk about? Uh, I, I have a question around the foliar sprays. Um, so I have a suburban backyard and so I have, you know, like 9,000 square feet and a tiny house on it. So there's, there's a ton of space for weeds um, because when we got the place, it was mostly wood chipped. And so we're trying to 
I've been into permaculture, which is, you know, very close uh, for, for a few years and trying to restore the land a bit. Um, and I think the foliar sprays are super cool. And I realized that I just have way more weeds than I will, like, I'll have way more foliar spray than I'll ever need. Is there, is there another step between foliar spray and like just composting it? that could be like a little bit more useful before they before they just go in the compost pile. Like obviously they're staying in the ground as much as I can, but you know, sometimes it, it's nice to have those materials on site. Yeah, there's another step that you may or may not have thought about and that is eat them. Oh, I do, <laughs> I do. <laughs> what weed do you have? Uh, I've been eating a lot of sour grass okay. um, and I think I have some plantains. And other things that I don't know, I'm still learning. Yeah, so I would, first thing I'd do is find out what you have and figure out how good they are to eat. Plantain is a great example of just an absolute wonderful weed. Um, not only can you eat it, but also if you get stung by a bee, um, you can take some of that plantain and chew it up and put it on your bee sting and it will draw out the venom from the bee and eliminate the sting immediately. Um, I've actually used plantain to remove ticks. Um, I'm outside a lot. I get bit by ticks. You're going to love this story. One time I got a tick inside of my belly button. It was deep yeah. inside of my yeah. belly button. And so I couldn't grab it and get the head out. All I could do is grab it. And I pulled the body out and I knew that the head was left inside my belly button. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And the answer is plantain of course and so i went into the yard and i found plantain and i chewed it up and i filled my belly button with it and i let it there sit there for about maybe half an hour 20 minutes and i pulled it out i chewed up another wad and i did that for three or four times throughout the uh the afternoon gone no irritation no red ring no nothing it was gone so plantain is an example of just an absolute wonderful resource in your backyard that is so beneficial for uh, bee stings, tick bites, uh, snake, anything, anything kind of thing that you need to draw the venom out of. So learn, what's, learn what those weeds are, eat them, uh, make fermented plant juice out of them, and then select your weeds. One of the things that I like to teach people in the garden is to select your weeds. Choose the ones that you want to grow there by allowing them to go to seed. If you don't like the weeds that are in your garden, don't let them go to seed, simply. And then take those weeds and put them on your compost pile. Find out the, what nutrition is in them and make fermented plant juices out of them. Know that the weeds are telling you about what's in your soil. They're telling you a story. Learn about them. Get that book, Why Weeds Talk, and learn a little bit about the soil. Get some books on herbalism and, and things like that and figure out what those weeds are good for. You're going to find out that tincturing those weeds is probably something that you need. My guess is there's a, there's a deficiency in your own health that those weeds can help you with. Uh, if you're lucky, the king of all weeds is stinging nettle. If you have stinging nettle around, you are so fortunate you can't even believe it. That is not only one of the most nutritious foods you can possibly eat, it is the multiple, multiple vitamin of the weed world. Um, I drink stinging nettle tea every morning. I have loads of it around. I use it to actually nurture my potatoes when I, after I harvest them. I actually put raw stinging nettle and a bunch of other things in the soil to nurture my plant. So in a nutshell, Yes, there's a lot of things you can do with those weeds. You can eat them, you can compost them, you can make fermented plant juice out of them. You can learn why they're there and what they're doing to them soil. You can make tinctures out of them to, for your own health. Thank you, this is, this is awesome. I will look into all of this. And if nettle is the king, then I say dandelion is the queen. <laughs> right on. Yeah, Greg, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I just, I also happen to be in Brooklyn, uh, and I'm Cheryl, and we uh, occasionally run into each other. Um, and I, um, with a group of folks, started a, a community garden here in Brooklyn about, uh, about 14 years ago, trying to do permaculture stuff. And before we got the first uh, water cistern in the ground and the first uh, aquaponic system installed, the city sold the middle of our garden. <laughs> So I hate to be kind of the Grinch that stole Christmas here, but um, you know, it's in the urban environment and particularly in New York City is like the ultimate 
a big city, um, dealing with all these nuanced discussions about various herbs and weeds and so on is so lost in the power politics of huge development, et cetera, and so on. That I mean, it's it's a more like if we're really going to be efficient or effective as permaculturists, we really need to get political. <laughs> because I mean, let's face it, we have eight and over eight and a half million people living in New York City. I have no idea what Portland's population is, maybe a million or something like that. So I mean, just in terms of being efficient in actually accessing the bulk of the population, I, I don't know. I mean, how do we scale up what we do to a level where it's not just on the fringes, but more in the mainstream? You know, I'm not sure the answer. If I did, I'd do it, but. <laughs> Adopt. I'll get there, <laughs> little by little. Adopt a well, politician. Hmm? Adopt a politician. Oh, well, yeah. Well, we had our new elected city council members showed up at our garden meeting. We were embarrassed and only had about six people there. <laughs> and ironically, he no. came out of the Black Lives Matter movement and the name of his group when he was doing Black Lives Matter was Warriors in the Garden. How prophetic, right? Um, so yeah, we've now got a majority of women in the city council in New York City for the first time. So things are hopeful, I grant, I grant you that, but it's somehow it just always gets flushed down the toilet when big money gets involved. And I don't know the solution. Um, uh, but, you know, word, word is getting out. It, it's gonna, right. We're going to get there. I believe that. Hey, Cheryl, right. did you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question and a comment. So in one of the slides, I saw that you had a lot of mugwort in a bucket to do a, a fermented fruit, uh, weed juice. And so I just wanted you to comment on that. And then um, the conversation about knowing your weeds. Um, in my garden, I get a lot of uh, lamb's quarters that grows. And so what I do is I will take some of those plants because they grow everywhere. And so I will dedicate an area in my garden to grow the lamb's quarters and the extra plants that I don't need, I'll put in a compost, but I will have a lamb's quarter bed. And it's one of the tastiest greens, one of the healthiest mineral rich greens um, and one of the local restaurants, Italian restaurants, sells it when it's in season. Um, so, you know, just really paying attention and knowing what's in the, the garden space as a quote unquote weed is really important. You know, I get a lot of, um, what's that one that it's like Velcro? Flavors. 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 Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'll make tea out of the cleavers and that helps to detox your lymphatic system. Um, you know, so just paying attention and, and not just, you know, and for years I would just dig the stuff up and get rid of it. And then after a while I started to be more mindful and really learn what was, you know, something that most people think needs to be thrown away. So that's right on. So, uh, well done to recognize mugwort in that bucket. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, these are just wicked healthy foods. They're, and to answer the question about what do you do, it's, it's pay attention. It's becoming mindful of what's in your environment. It doesn't matter if you're in New York or if you're in LA or if you're in Connecticut, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's seeing what's there. It's understanding the resources that are available to you. It's looking underneath the rocks. It's checking out the corners. It's recognizing the resources that you have available. It's what the what are the levels you have, the levers that you have, and it, we we can all we can all say oh dear and all these things and 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 be besieged with the oppressiveness that uh, large corporations have on us, and those are real things. But what we also can do is look around and become aware and talk and communicate and share ideas and recognize the boundless resources that are available to us. 
Um, mugwort, by the way, mugwort is actually in my book and, and you can see the mineral constituencies of both mugwort and lamb's quarter. These are things I've already looked at and done analysis on. Um, and what I'm finding is that um, when you do a soil test um, and, and you realize the minerals that are missing in your garden and then do an analysis of the weeds that are growing there, you might just find that those minerals are there. And so this is full circle. These things are all full circle. And what we can do is do what we can do. What we can do is pay attention and share ideas. Uh, Randy, do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak briefly to the seasonality of the biology, um, like such as if I want to grow some things in the fall versus starting them up in the spring, things that don't really grow well, what to do over winter. So I think that question was for me about something about seasonality of soil biology. Was that yes. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm wondering if you can speak to the differences uh, in the seasons regarding biology and what things we can do to support the biology in the different seasons. Like if there are specific things we should do over winter uh, versus you know the active growing season. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so soil, so plants and soil biology and things like this are, are really a function of the soil temperature. It's really not air temperature that determines what's going on. It's all about soil temperature. And, and, and soil temperature is really going to define a lot of what's going on, specifically in soil biology. Um, when the soil temperature gets below about 40 degrees, there's a big change in, in what's alive and active in the soil. And, and so um, uh, trying to keep temperatures in the soil above that temperature or above freezing matters. Even when the soil goes down below freezing, uh, it may become dormant. And quite frankly, as you go down into the soil deeper and deeper, you're eventually gonna find temperatures that are above freezing. Um, let me give you an example. I monitor the soil temperature two inches below the surface of the soil in three different or four different places in my lawn, in my garden area all year long. I've done this for about seven years and I've got some really interesting data about what goes on in the soil over uh, uh, an annual season. Right now, I am measuring the soil temperature in one of my gardens where I planted my garlic under some leaf mold, uh, some leaf uh, uh, crushed leaves, about four inches of crushed leaves. I'm measuring it in another garden where there's just bare soil. I'm measuring it in my hoop house and I'm measuring it in my cold frame, which is in my hoop house. And you can see the differences that these sorts of things make in the soil temperature. As an example, the temperature of the soil in underneath the leaves where my garlic is has been 40 degrees throughout the entire fall season. It got down to about 38 degrees maybe a couple of days ago. I live in uh, uh, Connecticut. Uh, I'm above a thousand feet. And so the temperatures here have been below freezing. Uh, it snowed a couple of days ago. Um, and um, uh, where most of the soil was frozen, if it was bare, those uh, temperatures under mulch uh, will remain above uh, freezing and in the 40 degree range. So what can you do? The most important thing you can do in your garden area in the wintertime is keep it covered. You wanna cover it with crushed leaves, straw, hay, any kind of material like that that you can get so that you can keep those temperatures high so you can keep that biology kicking along and moving. The second thing you can do is to feed the soil uh, biology in the form of leaf mold fermentation sorry, leaf mold biology, which is one of the recipes in my book. This is basically taking a bucket of water and putting a, a, baked pot a, a cooked potato and a handful of leaf mold in it and squishing them up and so that they become suspended in the water. And after a few days, depending on the ambient temperature, that bucket will become a thriving bucket of biology that can be used to, uh, uh, to feed your, your, your soils. So the other thing you can do is a, a, a low tunnel. Um, if you happen to want to buy plastic or some of the things that are, are required for low tunnels, um, but I like the mulch idea because it's, uh, I'll call it sustainable and regenerative. Um, the other thing you can do is build a hoop house or a greenhouse or other, way, other ways to cover the soil so that you can grow things in the wintertime. 
I planted spinach and a couple kinds of lettuce about uh, maybe two weeks ago in December, in the beginning of December, and they're this tall right now. I hope to eat these greens sometime during this winter month. I see a couple more questions. Hopefully we'll have time for that. <laughs> um, Cindy, did you have a question? Yes, I was wondering an alternative to um, a compost pile is cutting things up smallly, very small, and then throwing them on top of the beds. Yeah, you can do that. Um, and, and, and in many instances, that's a really great idea. The, vet, the compost pile is a tool that cannot be beat. Um, and once you understand what's really going on in a compost pile, and I'll tell you what it is, it's called digestion, right? Now you have the ability to start that pile to digest. And now you can start adding things to that pile to make up for the mineral deficiencies that are in other parts of your growing season, growing area. Now, this is where uh, things like uh, uh, um, in a city environment, if you have the opportunity for that small space to grow a compost pile, you can take many of the wastes in the city and start mixing the browns and the greens so that you can initiate digestion. Now you can start throwing things like fish. You can throw things like fish waste, heads and, and bones. You can throw things like rock dust and things into this compost pile and start adding the minerals that are needed so that you can get a, a, a final product that has the mineral diversity diversity as well as the biology in it, that then you can start applying places. So a compost pile is by far one of the most important tools that we have available to us. Once we understand what's really going on in that compost pile, understanding that it's a digestive process that we can use to mix things in to get the mineral diversity that we're looking for, as well as the life we're looking for. That's the same with IMO4. Uh, indigenous microorganism number four. It's another process that we can use to build up minerals and biological diversity that we can use to then apply to uh, uh, farm garden uh, pots. But putting that carbon on the soil is very important. Your suggestion of just putting it directly on the soil is not a bad one. As long as we know that it's going to digest on the soil surface because there's biology there and not stack up and form a crust on the surface that will prevent air from getting in and preventing water from getting in. So that's the difference between putting it on the surface and having it being effective versus it being a detriment. Okay. Yeah, I think you just have to try it you know, in your area and your situation. Um, we've tried, you know, putting bunches of things down and we always seem to end up putting it like in the compost pile. It just works better and then using more like halfway dried leaves. Um, we do have one guy here who's a farmer and he has an acre of farm and mm -hmm. I know he does a lot more of um, just kind of more like a chop and drop where he cuts it and then he lays it along. And I'm going to have to ask him, like, what's different from what he's doing? Because it's on the same property that he's doing this. And um, he doesn't seem to get the slugs or like the wet, you know, uh, sogginess. So yeah, I think you just have to try it out in your particular situation. So when you chop and drop, what you're doing is you're, you're, if you're facilitating the digestion process. You're breaking things up automatically. And there's going to be some biology in those, uh, in those surfaces. And they're going to take. And so when you chop and drop, um, you're actually not taking that. Remember I talked about taking things out of the soil versus leaving them in. So chopping and dropping is is providing that carbon back into the soil system. It's kind of like cover cropping, right? That's the other thing you can do in the winter time is you can throw down uh, a bunch of different seeds in the fall of things that are gonna grow and, and, and or use your weeds, let the weeds grow. And, and now those weeds are going to A, do two things. Remember, we've learned now that the plant is actually feeding the soil biology. So by having something growing on the surface, even if it's a weed, heaven forbid, you're feeding that soil biology, you're covering the soil, you're, you're causing the soil to actually regenerate and grow. Yeah, uh, Esme, did you have a question? 
Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I really want to say thank you for all the information. I've learned so much today. I am just getting started on my gardening journey and really focusing on healing my soil. Uh, I live in Florida and my soil is very sandy and this property used to be plantation land. Um, so I know that it's been very tilled and then it became a uh, suburban lawn sort of deal where it had a lot of things sprayed onto it. And I'm working really hard on getting it healthy because this past year, nothing thrived uh, except the weeds, um, which I'm very thankful to learn how to utilize the weeds now. Um, so I got a just fallen tree, a ton of uh, wood chips, and I let it age for like nine months. And I've just started spreading it around my lawn, trying to, uh, I guess, boost up the carbon um, so that it'll hold more moisture and more nutrients, hopefully. I was wondering if there's anything that I could be adding to that mulch to help boost the microbe life um, and to get my plants off to a good start when I start planting for spring. Yeah, so um, leaf mold biology is is the top of the list and there's a recipe for that uh, in that book. Um, you could use raw milk if you happen to have that and dilute it. You could use uh, um, IMO4, that's a little bit uh, at the far end. You can also make your own lactic acid bacteria that you can apply on there. In dire situations, in situations where uh, you just have such poor biological activity that um, uh, things just aren't happening, you can add uh, 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 sugar, cane sugar even. Molasses is probably the top of the, that, that list. And you dilute that and what you're doing is you're actually providing a bloom of food, a, a, a surplus of food for the biology that is alive in the soil. And it will take, and it'll grow, and it'll grow, and then as soon as the sugar wears out, it'll all die. But remember, the dead bodies and the poop of all of these microorganisms are the things that are going to create your soil solution. So what you want to do is, is, to, is to invigorate um, uh, biological growth in, in that surface. And the other thing that's cool about these biological growths is they're bioremediating. They're going to take care of a lot of the poisons and the, the nasty stuff that was in your soils uh, that uh, were there before you got there. That's incredible. Thank you so much. By yeah, the way, wood, chip, wood chips, I'm sorry, Cheryl, wood chips are a, um, a, a very high carbon content, but more appropriately, they take a long time to digest. So adding biology to a wood chip environment is really important and make sure it's not too thick that it uh, starves the uh, soil below of air and prevents water from getting through. I'm sorry to interrupt. Hi, um, also thank you so much for all this information. Um, wanted to just ask your opinion on three more plant-based materials um, that are readily available where I am. Well, two, and then another that's not. Um, so seaweed, uh, since, you know, New York is an island in New York City, and um, coffee grounds, coffee shops everywhere. And then what are your thoughts on biochar? Great. Uh, seaweed, top of the list. You can't go wrong. It comes, we all come from the ocean. So seaweed has all of those minerals in it. Making fermented plant juice out of seaweeds, putting them directly on your garden, putting them in your compost. It's a 10. You guys in New York have one of the best resources available. Come on, let's get going here. Okay, is that enough? About, did you get the point? <laughs> okay. You do. Okay, seaweed. Uh, what was the next one? What was the next one? I'm sorry. Uh, coffee grounds. Coffee grounds. Back to your banana peel comment, okay? I interview my coffee beans before I eat them, right? A lot of coffee grounds. Coffee is like a wicked, wicked uh, pesticide, fungicide side product. So a lot of the coffee beans you're going to be getting are loaded with, with those sorts of things. Um, but back to the same commentary. If that's all you've got and you've got a really active compost pile, maybe you can remediate some of those things. So the converse, now you're back to the conversation of what do you have versus what are you going to do, right? And recognize that that compost pile, once it starts really kicking in, it can remediate some of those things. Biochar. Biochar is, is, is a really interesting conversation for me. Uh, the, the reason biochar got such a great 
rap is because they found some in the Amazon that was a gazillion years old, a pottery sheds and all this beautiful thing. And they tested it. And oh my God, this stuff's fantastic, right? Well, guess what? When you make your biochar at home, what are you doing? You're cooking wood. Well, where'd the wood come from? It was, it's not the thousand year old product that everybody talked about with the same analysis. So the easy answer is all biochars are not created equally. And making biochar is no trivial task. It's very, it's labor intensive. It's energy intensive, intensive depending on how you build that fire. And there's, there's a fine line between the volatile gases that are going off and burning the bejeebers out of something. And what do you really end up with? And so I don't make biochar personally. And I question whether or not the biochar that you make at home or that you're purchasing has any relation to that Amazonian stuff that is uh, got the great uh, 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 characteristics on it. Seaweed, anything from the sea, anything, those crab shells, that lobster joint down the road, get those carcasses, man. Holy cow, are you kidding me? Um, well, we're just about out of time. Celia, I see your hand up. Yes, I have. I think this hopefully will be my final question. Um, we have a lot of ash. We have a wood stove that we burn and it's mostly trees that we're trying to clear from our land. What can we use the wood ash for? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, wood ash is, um, well, so a lot of people call wood ash pot ash right? And the reason yep. for that is it's very high in potassium. And while we want potassium, if you look at the mineral uh, proportions of, of potassium, it's relatively a small amount relative to what we really want. And so the thing to do is check out your soil and find out, well, how much potassium do I really want to put down on it? Now, I actually take my, my wood ash and I put some in my compost pile. I don't put it on my garden. I put a lot of it back in the woods because I'm really unclear of what is actually in it. And one of the things on my list is to do a real functional assay of what are the minerals within the wood ash that I'm using and burning in my place so that I can have an informed decision on what I'm gonna do. One of the things that I really wanna impress on people is this soil plant model allows you to make decisions, informed decisions, getting the data on what's in these mineral amendments. It gives you the opportunity to make informed decisions. And so the easy answer for you from me is what's in the wood ash and do you need it? From what I understand here in the state of New Mexico, we don't because whatever is in there, all that potassium, I understand we have quite a bit and this is where my conundrum is at. What do I do with it? And I don't want to just send it in the landfill because they don't really want to accept it. And so people say, oh, we'll put it in a plastic bag and take it. In. Well, I don't think that's an option because I don't like to use plastic bags. So that's part of the same reason why we don't go with a hoop house, you know, why we're looking at other alternatives, because what happens to that plastic in seven years when it's lived its life and the sun here in the, in the Southwest is really harsh on plastic. Yep. So um, I'm, I'm looking for alternatives. And so I'm starting to accumulate this is our first year farming and, and collecting the ash, but I, um, I'm, I'm looking for things and somebody put in here making soap. So maybe I need to Google that and see how that is beneficial. Sure. I so mean, thank soap, you. Can, you can wood ash and, and urine. Uh, I mean, you're talking the, the basis for making soap here. Sure. Right. So th that's a good idea. I think the first thing you need to do is do an analysis on it and find out what's in it. Okay. Now you can make an informed decision about whether you need it, whether your soil needs it. And then finally, if you have enough land, why not just give it back to the woods? And, and we've got two, actually three different areas that I can probably, so I'm gonna have to do some soil samples in, in all those areas and see where, where, where we're lacking in nutrients and, and then apply it there. One of the, 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 the amount of minerals that are in the world is a constant, right? theoretically, if you go with classic physics. Right. And so when we, what we're doing is redistributing those minerals. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're talking about. How do I redistribute the minerals that are in yep. my wood ash? Well, why not give them back to the place they came? Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and especially like lasting this whole time. Um, I'm Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you both. You're welcome. Great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put Nigel's info back up on the screen. And Nigel, do you have any um, closing comments? Uh, Pandora, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in your in your discussion today. And uh, thank you for inviting me and, and a pleasure to meet all of the people uh, that uh, participated and listen to your points of view. I think uh, one of the most important things for all of us is to be able to hear other points of view and learn from them uh, going forward. Um, I hope that uh, there have been a, a several tools that are offered to you that might be uh, advantageous going forth. Um, I guess my final comment is in order to be regenerative and sustainable, we need to understand more about what's going around and to look around us and to see what's going on and to pay attention. So thank you very much, Pandora, for the opportunity to participate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to put his info and um, that's about it. That's we all what we have for today. Your book is on your website, right? Uh, yes, it, it, it's uh, actually I don't sell it. It's through Chelsea Green, but there's a link on my website. Okay, to, cool. uh, to get thank it. you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, everyone.